All right, so we can start our meeting now. So this is where I hand it over to you, Gary. Gary is um, Gary Strang will be the acting chair for the meeting tonight. Uh, Jacinta McCann is not able to attend. So acting chair Strang. Great, thank you. My name is Gary Strang. I'm the acting chair of BCBC's Design Review Board. I am located at the Metro Center in San Francisco and our meeting will include participants who are here and those who are participating online. Our first order of business is to call the roll. Board members, please unmute yourselves to respond and then mute yourselves again after responding. Andrea, please call the roll. Okay, I'll start with you, Acting Chair Strang. Present. Uh, board member Kristen Hall. Present. Board member Stefan Pellegrini. Present. Okay, we have three board members in uh, the meeting room tonight, and then um, online we have board member Tom Leader. Here. And board member Bob Italio. Here, and I should let you guys know that on my screen or computer, your audio is kind of light. I can hear Tom pretty well, but I'm not sure if there's a, a volume issue. Okay, thanks. I'll, um, I'll try and adjust the audio in the room. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Andrea, we have a quorum. So we are duly constituted to conduct business. I wanna share some instructions on how we can best participate in this meeting so that it runs as smoothly as possible. For everyone online and in the meeting room, please make sure you have your microphones or phones muted to avoid background noise. For board members, if you have a web webcam, please make sure that it is on so everyone can see you. For members of the public, if you would like to speak during a public comment period that is part of an agenda item, you will need to do so in one of two ways. First, if you are attending on the Zoom platform, please raise your virtual hand in Zoom. If you are new to Zoom and you joined our meeting using the Zoom application, click the hand at the bottom of your screen. The hand should turn blue when it is raised. The second way, if you are joining our meeting via phone, you must press star nine on your keypad to raise or lower your hand to make a comment, and star six to mute or unmute your phone. We will call on individuals who have raised their hands in the order they are raised during the public comment period for each project. After you are called on, you, may, you will be unmuted so that you can share your comments. Please state your name and affiliation at the beginning of your remarks. Remember, you have a limit of three minutes to speak on an item, and we will tell you when you have one re minute remaining. Please keep your comments respectful and focused. We are here to listen to everyone who wishes to address us, but everyone has the responsibility to act in a civil manner. We will not tolerate hate speech, threats made directly or indirectly, and or abusive language. We will mute anyone who fails to follow those guidelines or who exceeds the established time limits without permission. For public comments, please note that we will only hear your voices. Your video will not be enabled. For members of the public attending our meeting in person in our headquarters building, I will ask you to maintain social distance during the meeting. The board secretary will call you up to the podium for public comment. Wearing masks is optional but recommended in this building. You will be asked to come up to the podium one at a time and to state your name and affiliation prior to providing your comments during the meeting. If you would like to add your contact information to the interested parties list to be notified at future meetings concerning these projects, please call or email the board secretary, Andrea Gaffney, whose contact information is on the screen or found on BCBC's website. Finally, every now and then, you will hear me refer to the meeting host, Ashley, our BCBC staff are acting as host for the meeting behind the scenes to ensure that the technology moves the meeting forward smoothly and consistently. Please be patient with us if it's needed. For example, now. Now the board secretary can provide a staff update. Are we ready to do that? Great. Uh, thank you, Acting Chair Strang. Um, Bob, I just wanted to check, how's the volume? Is it about the same? It is about the same. I can hear you a little bit better than I could hear Gary, but I think overall, if, if I'm hearing what's being recorded, it's, it's faint. And I've got my volume turned up to 64. <laughs> so it, I think it's faint. 
Uh, you might ask somebody else, maybe some uh, someone in the audience. Yeah. Or the, does it help if I speak into the microphone more, Bob? Th that does help quite a bit. Thank you, Gary. Okay. And hopefully it's not just okay. me. I mean, I, I, I can live with it, but I just, uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, Thank you. I can do that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We'll, um, we'll try and speak very close and directly into the microphones. Um, so quick set of updates for you this evening. Um, Peninsula Innovation Point in Burlingame was granted its permit by the commission on October 22nd and will proceed to construction shortly after plan review is completed. Uh, the 200 Twin Dolphin project that you reviewed in May uh, that's down in Redwood Shores in Redwood City um, is scheduled to go to the commission in December. Uh, so lots of projects being reviewed quickly and then moving on through permits. Um, in terms of DRB succession, I'm happy to report that all four board members who are contemplating, or sorry, completing the end of their second term have agreed to stay on for uh, the third and final term as board members. Uh, this means we will be initiating the process to recruit one architect board member and two to three alternates. Um, and I'll provide more information on that process in the December meeting. Um, new public access. So on the screen, you see uh, a photo of uh, what is affectionately referred to as P3. Um, it is the new triangle or I guess rectangular parallelogram park um, in front of the triangle parcel in Mission Bay along uh, Mission Creek. Um, this was designed by CMG. It's uh, between 3rd and 4th Streets and was very recently opened to the public. Um, and this is some of our uh, staff and intern staff uh, testing the Bay Trail segment. Um, for the upcoming design review board meeting in December, uh, we'll be on December 12th, and we'll inc include a project review of Monarch Bay in San Leandro. Uh, this project was last reviewed in early 2016 um, and has gone undergone very significant redesign. Um, so effectively, this will be like a third or fourth review, but really a first review for the redesign project. Um, and we look forward to bringing that to you in December. Uh, and that's all I have for the staff update. Um, and if there are any questions, I would welcome them at this time. And if not, then we can move on to meeting minutes. Okay, so we're gonna take a minute here to review the, uh, the minutes from 620 Airport Boulevard. Um, the project, which is very close to one of the sites we're reviewing tonight, is on Anza Lagoon, just to the south of, uh, of our second project for tonight. I have one comment. I just wanted to mention that uh, in the meeting, I, I think I had mentioned to show the below grade parking plan the next time they come, come back so we can see its extent on the site. And I didn't see that in the minutes. Anyone else? Yes. <clears throat> three edit um, item 2F. I don't know if this was my comment. Uh, I think it was re related to a comment I made, or I'm not sure, but it says we should try to pull as much development out of the shoreline band as possible, whether parking or building. And I think we were specifically talking about parking, um, like the child care center and things like that I thought we thought was appropriate. Um, item 3C. Um, the absence or redesign of the surface parking area and truck turning area along with the adjustments to the northwest corner of the westmost building could allow the Bay Trail to move inland more. I don't think that we were talking about the Bay, Bay Trail moving inland more. I think we were just talking about giving, um, letting that uh, edge that was on the eastern face of the sort of levee be more softened, not necessarily relocating the trail. And I think that's pretty well covered in the other notes, but I just wanted to clarify that point and anybody correct me if you think that was a mischaracterization. And then the third one was on circulation, item six. Um, uh, I had also mentioned that we wanted to see sidewalks along Twin Dolphin Road on the west side, given that it is the Bay Trail as it goes through there. Also, it should have some access or there's a, it's a Bay Trail access or some designation of Bay Trail access, so it should have an actual sidewalk. Um, yes. Okay, anyone else? Bob, Tom, no comments? Nope, no comments from Bob. 
Okay, if there's no further comments, then can someone make a motion to approve? I move to approve. Second? Second. Second. Approved. Okay. All right, thank you. So we can now begin our review of agenda item number four, which is the second review of Estuary Park Redevelopment. Oh, um, Gary, yes, I'm sorry. A... Um, before we get started, I, I wanted to uh, recuse myself from this item because ESA is working on it. And um, I would like to come back uh, for the, the second item uh, or the second project. Um, and I'm hoping that Andrea or, or someone could email me or text me uh, a notification. But with that, I, I should uh, recuse and I will um, leave the meeting. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks for that, Bob. Change. <clears throat> okay. He's uh, been taken off panelists, so he has technically uh, left the meeting at this point. Okay. So um, back to our review of Estuary Park redevelopment in Oakland and Alameda County. So to remind everyone of the project review order, there will be a staff introduction. Then the project proponent will make a presentation. There will be time for the board to ask clarifying questions and a period of public comment, followed by board discussion and summary, and then uh, a brief response by the project proponent if they so choose. So with that, um, BCDC staff Shruti Sinha will introduce the project. Thank you, Acting Chair Strang, and good evening, Design Review Board members. My name is Shruti Sinha, and I am a Shoreline Development Analyst at BCDC. Before I present the staff introduction, I would like to remind the project team and the staff to please turn on your video when you're speaking or answering questions. When you're not actively engaged with the board, please turn off your video and mute your microphone so that we minimize distractions on screen. And now I'd like to introduce the first project for tonight's review, which is the redevelopment of Estuary Park in Oakland. This project is proposed by the City of Oakland, and tonight will be the board's second design review of the project. Before we discuss the project, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the majority of the land in this area was once water and historic tide flats, tidal flats, a shared resource between the unceded ancestral homelands of the Huchin and Chalquin alone. We offer gratitude to the indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the bountiful natural, natural resources of the Bay Area. As you can see from this vicinity map, the project site is located on the western side of the mouth of the Lake Merritt Channel. It is bounded by Embarcadero West to the north, the Oakland Estuary to the south, and the Lake Merritt Channel to the east. Estuary Park is part of the multi-year, multi-project Brooklyn Basin project, and across the Lake Merritt Channel are the other project sites for that overall project. This is a closer aerial of what the site looks like right now. As you can see, the site is bounded by an apartment complex called the Portobello Apartments to the northwest and by the Embarcadero to the north. The Embarcadero is the only public thoroughfare from which people can enter the site. The two existing entrances from the Embarcadero are on the northeastern side, shown where you see the yellow circles. The left one for vehicular traffic and the right one for pedestrian access to the Bay Trail. But this northeastern part of the site is not included in the project you will be reviewing tonight. The proposed project area is outlined in red and would add another entrance to the northwestern side between the Portobello apartment complex and the parcel outlined in pink. That parcel will be a new land acquisition by the city of Oakland for Estuary Park and designated for public trust uses. This is a street view of the eastern edge of the park from the Embarcadero. As I mentioned in the earlier slide, this part of the site is not included in the redevelopment project, uh, in, in this phase of the, the project. 
that you will be reviewing tonight, but it shows what the park looks like to vehicular and pedestrian traffic on the Embarcadero. The entrance on the right is the existing vehicular entrance. If you drive up just a little further north on Embarcadero, this would be the current view of the western edge of the park. The empty field in the middle is the four acre lot that will soon be acquired by the city of Oakland and incorporated into the park. On the far left, you, see, you can see the Jack London Aquatic Center, and on the far right, you can see the Portobello apartment complex. According to BCDC's Community Vulnerability Mapping Tool, the project site is located within a 2020 census block associated with high contamination vulnerability and low social, vul and low social vulnerability. The social vulnerability indicators in the 70th percentile are renters, people with no vehicle, people who are not, and people who are not U.S. citizens. It is important to note that areas immediately east and northeast of the project site have moderate, high, and highest social vulnerability. In areas with moderate social vulnerability, the indicators include renters, people with no vehicle, people who are not U.S. citizens, and people with very low income. In areas with high social vulnerability, indicators include set renters, people with no vehicle, people who are not U.S. citizens, people with very low income, people of color, people with no high school degree, and people with limited English proficiency. In areas with the highest social vulnerability, indicators include all of the aforementioned, as well as disabled people and people over 65 and living alone. Regarding potential sea level rise, using current site elevations, this map shows what 24 inches of sea level rise would look like if the site remained unchanged. This project used the low-risk aversion scenario from the 2018 OPC sea level rise guidance for their park design. Both the low and the medium high-risk aversion scenarios are listed in the table on the left with their sea level rise projection. The bottom row shows what equivalent future total water level this map corresponds to for each risk scenario. 24 inches of sea level rise for the low-risk aversion scenario is equal to a king tide in 2050, which shows some flooding along the shoreline and the western edge of the site. For the medium to high risk aversion scenario, 24 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to the mean higher high water level, which would also cause some flooding on the site. This map shows what 66 inches of sea level rise would look like at the site if unchanged. 66 inches of sea level rise for the low risk aversion scenario is equivalent to a five year storm plus sea level rise at the end of the century, which shows some flooding and overtopping over the entire expanse of the project site. For the medium to high risk aversion scenario, 66 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to the 100 year storm at mid century and mean higher high water in the year 2090. This is an aerial rendering of the site plan that was shown to the DRB in the project's first review in June of this year. And this is the site plan that was reviewed by the DRB in June. The pr proposed project has been updated uh, for this review in response to the comments re received in the first uh, DRB review. Among these updates, the project has paid special attention to preserving the Halpern design, revised the connection to the southeast pier, and a cleaner transition from the Bay Trail, realigned and marked the continuity of the Bay Trail at the Gathering Plaza, raised the elevation of the restrooms for future flood resiliency, widened pedestrian and bicycle access from the Embarcadero, changed the design of the Event Plaza, with Bay Trail users in mind, increase the inner radius of the Bay Trail turn at the south southern corner of the park, and eliminated the habitat garden. That summarizes my staff introduction to the Estuary Park project. As you conduct your review tonight and provide your feedback, please keep in mind the public access design guidelines that you see on the left of your screen, which emphasize usable and welcoming public space, visual access, connectivity along the Bay shoreline, and compatibility with wildlife uses. 
In addition, the staff report shared with you on November 3rd provided several other questions that staff would like the board's advice on, which are summarized on the right side of the screen. Number one, overall design and circulation throughout the park. Uh, this includes changes to existing significant park elements as they pertain to the public's invitation to enjoy the waterfront and the, e and the southeastern corner of the park. Number two, signage, interpretive elements, and lighting. Number three, management and main maintenance, including plant palette. Number four, special events. Size, uh, we, we'd like you to consider size, location, types and frequency of events, um, and balancing special events with public access. Event programming areas, area of, areas of closure and access routes. And five, proposed beach design in consideration of its function to park users and rising sea levels. With that, I am happy to answer any questions the board might have on the site context. Please turn your microphone on. Thank you. Yeah, is there, thank you, Shruti. Is there any clarifying questions from the board? Okay, if there's none, then we can proceed with the uh, proponent's uh, presentation. Thank you. So now I will hand it off to Jacob Tobias of WRT to present the project on behalf of the City of mm -hmm. Oakland. Good evening, Design Review Board and BCDC staff. Thanks for the opportunity to come back here and uh, present some refinements and improvements to the design since the last time you saw it, the project. I'm Jake Tobias, Project Manager and Landscape Architect at WRT. Um, I'm joined by John Gibbs, Principal in charge of the project at WRT, who will also help uh, answer questions and, and help present the project. So an outline of what I'll be presenting. We will review the uh, DRB comments from June 13th. In summary, a brief overview of the comments. And then we'll dive into the presentation, um, looking at the overall site, the conceptual plan from the master plan, the draft master plan that the city of Oakland is, is um, reviewing, looking at circulation in that, at that overall site scale as well to answer some of your questions. Uh, looking at an overview of our design refinements site-wide and then diving into the following topics. The pedestrian co connectivity from Embarcadero, the Bay Trail and, and how that design was improved and refined for comments from you and also from Yu Huo. Uh, the southern shoreline area, diving into that um, design a little bit in more detail than we did the last time. There were a lot of comments about the southeastern corner of the site, specifically near the, the southeastern pier. We'll review security and durability, and then talk about um, responses to uh, further analysis we've done of the Halperin design as an important feature of the park. Your comments covered a lot of topics. Uh, broadly here, overall site as one facility, so we'll, that's why we'll be looking at that uh, for the first few slides. The southern waterfront design, questions of, about how that uh, functions and, and diving into the design a little bit more. As I mentioned, the southwest pier, questions about how that functions. 
um, boating program elements and relationships with JLAC. So how do boaters still get to the water, uh, basically, and specifically the JLAC users and also public boaters? There was a question about the turf area, which um, I won't dwell on in this uh, presentation. We can return to it if need be. Security and durability of materials. Connectivity to water access points. Furnishings and lighting. Again, the helper and design analysis and our response. The bay trail design and pedestri pedestrian connectivity were topics. The role of gathering and events and um, overall topic of resilience. This presentation is going to focus on uh, those comments that led to significant design changes. And uh, we're happy to return to other comments if need be at the end of the presentation. I'm going to skip these since Shruti did such a good job of contextualizing the project and showing existing conditions photos. Um, this is the conceptual plan from the draft master plan document that is currently under review in the city of Oakland. Um, the, the request on, on the part of the DRB was to look at how the overall site functions. And in particular, um, you'll see in the next slides that our phase one project does not include the area around the JLAC building. Um, we thought it was important to illustrate, though, that a long-term vision for the site would include improvements to the Bay Trail along the eastern edge of the site there and other connectivity improvements through that JLAC site, uh, both for, for ve vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists. The circulation diagram shows how the Bay Trail will run, what does run through the site and will run through the site, and um, boating program water access. We're, as, as you might remember, uh, adding a new boat storage facility and also showers and locker rooms for boaters. Uh, the showers and locker rooms are in that square uh, building to the south of the boat storage, and there will also be public restrooms, publicly accessible restrooms in that building as well. We have carefully considered how do you move these giant rowing shells through the site. And so the arrows uh, indicate that um, you can get in and out of the boat storage facility and move around the JLAC building, much as they do now, um, with a little bit of more um, room for turning and so on. The project maintains the existing um, docks, and so there is no change to that access point, and it does cross the Bay Trail as it does now. We are also improving through striping of the parking lot north of the Daylight Building water access for boats that come, people who bring boats on trailers. Um, so that's shown there. There was a question about in the occasional large regatta event, um, are there alternative routes for people using the Bay Trail? Uh, and we are showing here that yes, indeed, you can get around the JLAC building by bike or on foot in a number of ways. So an overview um, on the left is the plan that you saw at our last review meeting, and on the right is the plan where, as it stands today. I just want to mention that we are uh, complete, we've relatively recently completed the 65% construction document package, so these drawings are right out of our construction documents, so that's why the graphic quality is such as it is. Um, so I'll just around the site from the upper left, which we're calling the northwest. Um, the design refinements that were in response to many of your comments include uh, improving the pedestrian access to Embarcadero on the northwest side of the uh, northwest corner of the site, and we'll zoom in on each of these. Um, improvements to the Bay Trail overall. The southern shoreline has been developed more especially with regard to um, access and the Bay Trail. The southeastern pier area, 
significantly improve that design. And then moving up, uh, again, counterclockwise, um, the Bay Trail improvement at the main um, event plaza and segregating Bay Trail function from plaza function. And then I should not fail to mention that the uh, Halprin design, uh, the response to the Halprin design has changed, and we'll talk about that. So starting in that northwestern corner, the um, main drive of our design modification was to increase the visual and functional size of the pedestrian access balancing it with vehicular access and clarifying the uh, multi-use multi uh, access point, which is bicycles and pedestrians, segregating that from vehicular entrance and clarifying um, how uh, pedestrians would move through the entry plaza and down the 20-foot um, the wide EVA and fire access route. So that really becomes a very generous pedestrian spine uh, not only used as an EVA access, but a very, we expect it would be a very well used pedestrian and bicycle trail as well. Regarding the Bay Trail improvements, um, overall, we really focused on improving the clarity of the functions and identifying major potential conflict points at intersections uh, with pavement color and um, uh, striping and also geometric design of those conflict points so that there's more room for all of the users and more visual cues about, uh, about bicycles yielding to pedestrians at those crossing points. Zooming in on uh, three of the areas that we uh, modified, the south uh, western corner, the um, intent is that the Bay Trail uh, is the width that's got, uh, recommended for a highly used portion of the Bay Trail. So it's indicated to be 17 feet here. There are 20 feet clear. And then at these conflict points, um, the signage is intended to indicate to bicyclists that they should yield to pedestrians and slow down and um, organize themselves in directions so that uh, bicyclists and pedestrians have clear views of each other there's also, it's just the, the sh lightly shaded area, but that would be uh, colored asphalt indicating that there's a, a transition in use there and a conflict, potential conflict point. And then you can also see that where trails cross from the park to the shoreline, there are crosswalk markings. Um, on the southeast, with regard to the Bay Trail in particular, we increase the radius of that turn on the inside of the corner. And then this will come up again when we talk about the design for the, the pier area, but we expanded the, uh, the, the pavement around that corner so that there's a sort of a, a refuge area or an eddy, if you will. So pedestrians and people who just want to sit or stand and enjoy the views there have a place to step away from the main thoroughfare of the Bay Trail. And then, um, on the upper right hand, where the gathering plaza is, just south of the JLAC building and the restroom, we moved the gathering plaza westward. Um, that gathering plaza, we expect obviously large numbers of people, uh, potentially food trucks, and there was a desire among a number of stakeholders to provide a potential roller skating uh, space. And so this is sized according to precedent for roller skating spaces. That whole function now fits to the west of the Bay Trail itself. Um, I'm going to go back a couple of slides and just show how we've changed that part of the design. So when you saw the design before, the Bay Trail crossed right through the middle of that plaza. It wasn't marked as such, and uh, we thought it was an important and valid comment to clarify the function there. section through the Bay Trail on the eastern side of the, of the park, showing the width of 20 feet and the relationship to the water itself, indicating that we are elevating that uh, elevation and much of the park to um, the 
0.7 NABD elevation, which brings us uh, to mid-century, or 50 years, so 2070. section through the Bay Trail along the southern edge of the park showing how it relates to the um, southern shoreline, uh, the, the southern uh, uh, beach. We're, we're calling it a beach. It's a gravel beach. And uh, we're calling it a transitional area where there are dunes and uh, plantings and opportunities to sit in that zone. The Bay Trail itself in this area is the 17-foot wide uh, mixed-use pathway with a three-foot wide Clear, additional clear space, so we have 20 feet of clear, and then um, seating now uh, facing both ways towards the shoreline and towards the multi-use um, uh, field. Uh, so we've reorganized this, this section significantly to accommodate different types of users. The Bay Trail then becomes not only something to walk, you know, go through on bike or on foot, but also something to actually sit in and enjoy on the edge of it. The Southeast Pier area, uh, we heard a lot of good comments about uh, a certain lack of clarity about how you would use this space, and also concern that the Bay Trail uh, wouldn't function here with that tight corner. Uh, as I already mentioned, we um, expanded the width of the Bay Trail, uh, created that 20-foot radius, and then equally importantly, made it a, a place for people to really enjoy uh, the Concrete step seating will be similar to the existing Halpern seating along the, the shoreline itself, the stepped bulkhead. And then more clarity about stair access down to the existing pier. There's also uh, accessible routes there to the, the left. There's an accessible route that leads down to that pier level. Perspective views of the same thing. We'll get into this soon, but the other uh, notable thing I want to mention on this view is the relationship now with the Halpern Pergola. Uh, the, um, the Halpern design in general is now more, uh, a lot of aspects of it that are now maintained that weren't before, and then it really starts to relate to this new pier feature, or this new feature right north of the pier. There were questions about security and durability. Um, with regard to security, one of the secondary benefits, I'd say, of the elevating the Bay Trail to that 11.7 NAVD line is that there's no longer the need for a grade, vertical grade change between the Halpern Pergola area and the adjacent Bay Trail. So, um, and we will remove portions of that wall, although we will maintain part of it. Um, that opens up views to an area that right now is uh, primarily used by those that um, don't make it necessarily particularly comfortable for all users. I'll put it that way. Um, the furnishings we've selected are both aligned with the Halperin aesthetic, but also really um, keeping an eye out for durability. Large wood timbers, uh, the vestry sun benches are also already being used on the Oakland waterfront, so they're tried and true. And then lighting. Uh, basically all of the pathways on the site will be lit with pole-mounted lights um, or along the water edge bollards. And then lighting in the parking lot. John is going to present the Halpern uh, design and, and our response to that. John Gibbs, WRT, good evening. Um, just to continue right along, um, you can think you guys were really clear in picking up on the importance of the Halpern legacy out here at the site, uh, as we did. And moving forward from our last meeting, we've just adopted the working assumption that um, uh, that it does have an historic designation. So we're adhering to Secretary of Interior standards. Uh, we're working closely with our cultural resource consultant uh, in the context of CEQA. 
So we've identified what are those historic elements um, that make up the character defining uh, features out there, uh, what really still exists um, today from the original design, and then how do we how do we maintain those? And I think you know we were doing that loosely before, but now we're we're just being really by the book, and it's really elegant and really beautiful. Uh, this is an original uh, kind of master plan for the overall area which does show some form of a pergola. It shows uh, the allay. It shows some cross axes, and it shows some wall features uh, between the allay and the pergola. Those walls, you know, as, we, as Jake just noted a minute ago, are certainly part of the security challenges out there today with the big um, kind of sight lines and creates a real hidden area. Um, but I think we've found some, some elegant ways to move forward. So we've documented what was in the original design there on the left. Those are the existing elements uh, from the tree allay um, to the, the, the stepped bulkhead to those cross-angled paths. Um, and then on the right-hand side, this is what the current design uh, starts to look like. And I you know, what, think what we're seeing is that there's, um, there's some, some important adherence and, and maintenance of a lot of those elements. A couple that I would point out. Uh, zeroing right in on the furnishings underneath the pergola uh, as it exists today there are um, these you know kind of um, uh, large timbered uh, very long picnic tables um, that both need a lot of repair also have some accessibility challenges to them we're maintaining the two on either end so the numbers four uh, those are retained those will be refurbished as is and then the ones in the center would be new, modern, but in the same kind of alignment, the same kind of uh, similar presence and function uh, as before. Looking at the walls, uh, this is the brown uh, north-south element that we see on the left-hand side, and it wraps all the way around uh, as number five, wraps all the way around to the south and, and off to the left. In our proposed design, we're maintaining a center segment of that. Uh, but we would remove the north and southern uh, extents of that. And the, um, our historic resources team really feels like maintaining you know, some element of that is really important. Uh, it's part of the character defining elements. We think it actually makes a nice um, protection area for that, the, the center section of the picnic tables under the pergola. We have barbecues and things up against it, so it sort of fits nicely. Um, however, you know, certainly the, the extent down to the south uh, would really you know, not be as appropriate uh, and would start to hamper the function of the Bay Trail. So I think we found a, kind of an elegant solution there. Um, other elements I think just are shown here in terms of the trees and the, the cross-angled pathways uh, connecting the pergola over to the existing bulkhead wall. I think those are some of the key features out there. There's existing benches. Maybe I would just mention the existing benches between the wall and the um, and the bay trail, the LA. Those are uh, replaced, um, but they sort of maintain a similar function there in that open DG area. Um, both double-sided benches and single-sided benches that I'll show pictures of in a minute. So just to go back in time to June, there on the left is where we were before. Um, and then again, where we are today uh, in our current proposal. And I think you know, you'll see some of the changes just in terms of um, different orientation of the furnishings under the, uh, under the pergola instead of replacing all of them. Uh, we're really maintaining the existing ones at the north and south and then uh, maintaining same uh, locations, uh, even though we're updating the furnishings for the ones in the center. Uh, the weird uh, white lines that crossed, those are, those are just gone, and um, we've really cleaned that up to maintain the historic three, uh, sorry, two main uh, cross, cross axes and, and pathways there as well. Jake kind of did a nice job explaining the, um, the connection of the Bay Trail north through the, um, uh, through the event plaza, so I think that's kind of already described. Um, I think one thing to point out, there's, you know, there's a lot of um, nice trees up in that area, and so we've actually brought in a lot of those trees um, into the final design as well. Just as a cross-section, 
uh, just laying out the, the horizontal relationship of elements and, and kind of maintaining that same character of, of a lay of bulkhead walls on the water side, moving to the pergola, and then introducing, uh, you know, I think completing a design in terms of adding other uses that really are supported by the picnic tables under the pergola <coughs> in terms of a play area and connections over to the lawn. Um, but a change here is raising the grade of the Bay Trail. So there's this now um, kind of an important um, relationship that, that in fact extends the, the presence of the pergola um, over to the LA and it makes a, a more usable area and I think a, a contemporary response to a, to a historic uh, pattern, a uh, historic set of, set of elements. And that's done for sea level rise purposes to maintain uh, public access to the Bay Trail also has important public safety uh, outcomes as well. So just some of the existing photos, that existing uh, gravel surface delay becomes the, the Bay Trail. You can see some of the cross-axis paths. You can see the presence of the pergola. And somewhere in there is the section of the wall that, that we're going to be maintaining. Here under the pergola, it's remarkably similar in that the furniture stays in the same location, uh, but it's updated. Uh, the wall with the barbecues and, and some trash facilities and things are importantly placed uh, on the right side. Nice open connections on the left out to the park. And then looking north towards the JLAC building at the north end of the LA. Um, currently the trail sorts to become less clear where to go and as this is the major bay trail really strengthening uh, that connectivity north uh, and then ultimately uh, along the shoreline past the, the JLAC building. You can see some of the color treatments to really highlight that this is a uh, mixed, um, a shared use area between uh, the plaza and, and the cyclists that are moving through the zone. Along the bulkhead wall, um, maintaining the bulkhead wall, maintaining the, um, the bollards that are there, replacing trees. You can see there's a slope here because this is a transition uh, we don't have budget to uh, replace the bulkhead wall along here, so that's something that would be part of an adaptation strategy in the future that's identified. Um, but adding a little bit more of a pathway here so that uh, it is accessible and it is a place where people can walk, people can access the bulkhead wall, and actually we want to encourage folks to be able to sit there along those bulk the, the bulkhead wall. Looking a little bit more closely at the furnishings and just digging in the the, um, the existing uh, double-sided bench um, that comes out of the Halpern area. We're adding uh, new and replacing this with new double-sided uh, benches. Uh, so they're in the same family, uh, but they're decidedly different, especially with the steel plate base underneath. And in particular, that's sort of how we um, find our way through Secretary of Interior standards. Similarly, we have existing picnic tables. Um, this is one that we're going to be refurbishing, we'll actually leave everything and just replace the, uh, the, the top and the seats. Um, but then where we've uh, replaced existing and, and, and with a new one, that's what's shown on the left. So kind of a similar treatment in the family, um, but decidedly from, from today's era with the steel plate base. That concludes our presentation. Great, thank you so much. That's fantastic to see all the changes you've made and also to know that um, you're working on the CDs as it's moving along. Um, we have an um, opportunity here for the board to ask any clarifying questions on that presentation. Okay, Kristen. Thank you so much for that presentation. <clears throat> um, I just had one small question, which was the boat, um, movement are the have you talked with JLAC and are they happy with having to pull their boats out into the parking lot before walking to the shore is the only question yes we have uh, been in in collaboration with the voting users they're one of the main stakeholders and they helped us with this design in fact we didn't have enough room before uh, the whole uh, boat storage facility, we had to slide it southward 
for that very reason. Um, that's that's the, the short answer. There's a lot more to it, but yes. It was mostly this, just this part. It looks like they have to walk into the parking lot before walking, and it is that they're, they feel that that's safe. Yeah, we've talked about that. <laughs> Excuse me. Yep, they do. Okay. In, in, essentially, um, they don't move those boats that frequently. Okay. You know. Great. Thank you. Tom has his hand up. Uh, one question on the the trees, which are uh, next to the pergola. So, I want to make sure I'm understanding. So, you're raising the grade, uh, so that there's not a big grade difference between the behind the wall and Right. So are the so the the new trees? These are new trees. We're not. You're not saving the old trees, right? You're raising the grid. Am I understanding right. that right? Okay. What what is what type of are those sycamores? Are now uh, either sycamores or London planes. Yeah. And uh, is there? I, I guess you're duty bound to plant more more plane trees? I think we're, that's a good question. We need to review that with our, uh, with the um, cultural resources uh, yeah. person. But no, we don't, we, don't, we don't expect that it has to be the same species. They listed the LA itself as a critical feature. Right. I mean, they look pretty, pretty sad after 50 years. And uh, I wonder if there's anything that would uh, resist a little better the wind and fog that's done that to them. Absolutely. We, we will be looking very carefully at what species we're planting out here. We're working with the uh, city of Oakland closely on that and agree that that's, that's an important okay. consideration. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Stephen. Um, I have a clarifying question about the 2100 adaptation strategy. Am I understanding correctly that the that would require the raising of the bulkhead or the reconstruction of the bulkhead and that is seen as sort of a future investment but that the elevation of the bay trail is positioning it above the sort of anticipated mid-century condition is that am i that's right i understood that correctly um thank you for that um could you comment on the choice to treat the Bay Trail as a bi-directional bicycle lane and in that context of uh, maybe choosing the materials at the ground plane um, along the shoreline edge? Yes, uh, I want to clarify that it's not intended to be a bi-directional bike path. It is intended to be a multi-use trail and that the striping at these conflict points is really meant to be indicating that cyclists need to yield to pedestrians. We fully anticipate working closely with Yi Huo about exactly how this striping needs to be designed. He did make a comment about that uh, prior to this meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we will be refining that design with him um, and with the uh, City of Oakland uh, Department of Transportation as well. Um, but I just want to make sure that it's clear that the intent is, is it's multi-use and that we actually want to indicate that cyclists need to slow down and yield at those points, not that they have priority. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. And then just along that lines, is there anything in the Halprin design with regards to the treatment of the ground plane that sort of rose to the level of um, historic treatment? It wasn't listed by our cultural resources consultant as one of the major elements. Uh, we are currently showing that it's a stabilized decomposed granite, and it had been stabilized, or it had been decomposed granite uh, previously. Um, we do still need to work with the city of Oakland to make sure that they're comfortable with that material from an accessibility and maintenance point of view, but that is our intent right now. Thanks very much for those clarifications. Okay, um, I have a couple of comments. So um, that uh, DG that you're talking about now, is that where the Bay Trail is currently located? So people are currently riding on that kind of loose gravel. Currently, it's almost not even DG on the southern edge of the site. So yes, it's very... Yeah. 
Okay, great. And then as far as raising the grade there, there's a retaining wall. When you raise the grade, does that mean that the retaining wall, is it still elevated above the grade of the pergola or is it completely buried? It will, it's about four feet above finished grade at the pergola level. So the intent is we would bury the bottom few feet of it, a cup, two feet, roughly two or two and a half feet or so. Okay. Uh, but that, the, the segment that's retaining just remains. So it's kind of a curb or maybe a low seat or something like no, that? No, no, it would still be four feet. It's four feet. Ru I believe it's four feet high on the pergola side. In other words, here, let's see if we can. No, it doesn't. It's 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 aligned with these posts <laughs> of the pergola. Um, keep going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I I'm not sure I understand that because if you're raising the the bay trail Here by this four one. So this is on the, on the right. Mm -hmm. That's I well see. both. That's okay. the, that's from the pergola level. So it is roughly four feet high from the finished grade of the pergola level. Does this clarify? Yeah. So yeah. on the other side, it's even higher. On the other side, it's currently even higher. Got it. Got it. Okay. All right. And then um, I think as far as the um, the Halpern benches that were, or the picnic, is it picnic tables that we're looking at there in the middle? Kind of hard yes. to tell. Yeah. Is there something that keeps you from just restoring the ones that are there or from, you know, refabricating the exact, you know, same uh, steel and boards in the exact same sizes? So right, the intent is we'll do that on the ones on the end, but you're asking about the ones in the middle. Yeah, I'm just well. curious, yeah. but you know, why you're changing them. I know that if they're new, then you wouldn't want to copy the helper and benches. But if you're just repairing something that's already there, you know, what was your thought yeah. on that? Largely, it's functionality and accessibility. Um, there's clearance requirements um, for depth of a of a extended leg in a wheel in a person in a wheelchair to extend under the table, and there. Are these are currently built with these really heavy beams that are part of the support structure, not only the topping, but the, the underbelly of these picnic tables has all sorts of obstructions. So it could be possible to get in there and try to redesign it to, so part of it was original and then there was this like modified piece, but they're not in, they're not, they're not in excellent shape and we think it's a reasonable approach and our cultural resource folks feel uh, feel inclined as well to replace them with something okay. that's yeah, accessible great. and clean. Thank you. And then um, my final question, it looks like you added parking in the north at the entry, is that correct? There's a median in the parking lot and it looks like they added another double, double row of parking. So I'm just curious, I, I didn't remember that we discussed that or that it was needed or maybe it was. No. The parking layout changed, but the parking counts haven't changed. I see. Okay. Um, two things happened. One is we moved the trailer, boat trailer parking, to the east, so it's now not it's cut off on this view, but it's north of the JLAC, closer to the water. That was working better. Um, and then the other thing is we need to accommodate uh, the stormwater um, management by retention planters better. That's grading required that we widen the median in the middle there. So that's. That's why they look different. And those both worked hand in hand because you couldn't get the boat trailers mm -hmm. to fit with the buyer retention. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think that is all the questions we have, unless um, Tom might have anything else. Uh, so we can move on to the public comment. And do you know, Andrea, do we have public comment tonight? Because I have long instructions to read. Uh, uh, I believe we will have public comment. I have emails that I'll be summarizing, but um, it looks like, um, well, no one yet, but I, I know there's people on the call that may want to um, make public comment. So I think go ahead and read the um, okay. instructions. Okay. Now that the presentations and board questions are complete, let's open the meeting to public comment. Any member of the public attending the meeting in person, please notify the board secretary if you would like to make a comment. If you're attending online and would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand to speak. <clears throat> Remember, if you're joining our meeting via phone, you must press star nine on your keypad to raise your hand to make a comment. 
to unmute or mute, press star six. You will be called in the order your hand was raised and you will have three minutes to speak. Ashley will note when you have one minute remaining. Please state your name and affiliation for the record at the beginning of your comment. As mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, if you would like to add your contact information to the interested parties list to be notified of future meetings concerning the project, please call or email Andrea Gaffney. Um, so you, you want to read from the public comments first, or do we want to take comments from the public? Well, I'm still not seeing any hands raised online, so I'll uh, go ahead and start with the emails that we received and then maybe give that people time to raise their hands if needed. Um, so I'll start with the Bay Trail um, comment received from Lee Huo uh, on behalf of the Bay Trail organization. This was received on November 10th. Um, first comment is about the trail project area. Um, so something appreciating the 20 foot wide trail, but the improvement stop near the JLAC, um, they're asking for consideration through the entire park, including the JLAC area and how the Bay Trail will uh, move and be designed um, through the, you know, the northeastern corner of the park. Uh, in regards to trail design, um, at the southeast corner, there's a question or comment about how the um, paving appears to be textured or grooved um, on the Bay Trail, and um, staff notes that the um, surface should not have deep grooves or textures to allow for safe operation of bicycles. Uh, in regards to the pedestrian use, um, project proponents noted that this comment already, um, but the striping seems to indicate that it's only used for a two-way bicycle path. Um, however, the Bay Trail is for both pedestrians and bicyclists and should be designed uh, to allow for both users, user groups. Um, and then the fourth comment topic was events and gathering impacts and so this is I think mostly in the the plaza um, in area 13 um, some of the exhibits appear to show the event and gathering space that straddles across the Bay Trail and so the design and location of the events and gathering space at Estuary Park must ensure that through access along the Bay Trail is not impacted by event activities planned at Estuary Park and the event and gathering plaza must be designed to delineate a clear path for the Bay Trail and its users to maintain access during the Bay, on the Bay Trail during events. Um, so that, those are the Bay Trail comments. Um, let's see. Then we have uh, comments from, um, we received two comments from um, William Threlfall. Um, some of them echo what um, was said about the Bay, um, from Bay Trail staff um, about um, being silent about the, you know, the northeastern corner um, and the design um, of the Bay Trail, not considering the sort of the area around JLAC and the northeastern corner of the site. Um, the limited scope of the plan, um, asking board members. Um, and BCBC staff to review the entirety of the master plan as opposed to just phase one of the improvements, um, even though that the construction and the funding is limited to phase one, um, they are requesting comments and feedback on the entirety of the master plan, which includes phase two of the JLAC area. Um, the next comment is regarding a public launch. Um, so I'll just read this one. Um, so as this is a waterfront park, public launch seems a keystone element and I urge more attention to this need, which is not well met elsewhere in Brooklyn Basin development. The current design simply retains existing facilities which are in poor condition or largely dedicated to use by the Jacqueline and Aquatic Center clients. Conser the current design of the park may need revision to more fully address the guidance from the Bay Plan recreation policies uh, pertaining to uh, incorporating access facilities for non-motorized small boats and then goes on to cite policies referencing those um, and placing public launching facilities in waterfront parks where feasible. 
um, there's a comment about providing um, a small craft soft launch area that's convenient to the parking area. Um, the pocket beaches are located far away um, from the parking and one of the uh, launch areas is outside of the project scope um, for phase one. So asking that the design include a renovation plan for the Bay Trail throughout Estuary Park, a plan for enhancement of par public waterfront access and launch facilities throughout the park and includes a comprehensive master plan for the park with phased construction based on available funding. And this was from William Thurfall, who is the chair of the Oakland Measure DD Community Coalition Estuary, Estuary Park Study Group. Um, he sent a follow-up email. Oops. Um, He's on the call, so I, I'm going to ask him if he wants to reiterate the comments that he provided in uh, his follow-up email. Um, yeah, he's raising his hand. So I'd like to invite him to do that at this time. So, um, Mr. Threlfall, oh, we yes. unmuted you, so please go ahead. You have three okay. minutes. Uh, the follow-up comment was uh, an indication that the uh, the master plan uh, makes reference to a soft launch facility uh, to be located in the region that is outside the dotted line uh, defining this specific project limit. Um, and so, uh, when considering the uh, when considering the uh, the provision of that, that when you look at the master plan document uh, on screen, the, the, the layout, it doesn't show up. So the question was, is that in fact part of the plan for this project? It's referenced in material sent to BCDC for tonight um, as, a, uh, as an amenity of the plan. Uh, and so it wasn't clear to me since it does not in fact show up on the rendering uh, but it is in it is in the in the BCDC staff description of the project. I'm I'm sorry that I'm not uh, wasn't prepared to actually comment on this, but uh, the that's the question. What the description you have received uh, from uh, from Larry Goldspans uh, includes this amenity, this soft launch facility. But in fact, it is not shown on the conceptual site plan now in front of you on screen. So the question is, is it part of the project? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we will um, allow the project proponent to respond to that um, after we finish uh, reviewing the other public comments. Thank you. Uh, the <coughs> follow-up comment is from uh, Naomi Schiff, who is also a measure of member of the Measure DD Coalition um, and is echoing William Thruffle's comments um, about the Bay Trail um, and about the inclusion of the um, Northeast, I think I kept saying Southeast, I meant Northeast corner of uh, Estuary Park around the JLAC Center. Um, so I, I don't think I need to repeat the comments that have already been made. Um, I think that's um, all. We did receive another comment from uh, former staff attorney, John Bowers, um, who was supporting this idea of considering the entirety of the master plan uh, in our permitting process, um, which is um, one way we often work. Um, so that is something that staff is looking into and will follow up with the project proponents about. Um, I think that's all we have. There's no one else with their hands raised online. So um, I think if it's easy to answer the question um, about the um, small craft launch area um, and its inclusion, exclusion, and location, then um, 
acting chair string is that okay if the project proponents respond to that yeah or? that would be helpful okay yeah also i'm not totally sure i know what is the bay trail section that is being suggested to be improved so it's off site yeah let's um I, mean, I think let's have the project proponents um answer these questions because i think they will help the board discussion as well Okay. Yeah, Jake Thanks. can show on screen with the area we're talking about. And I think first and foremost, you know, it's the area shown here where Jake's, Jake's going to show this cursor connecting from Embarcadero to the north all the way down to um, kind of the frontage of the JLAC building. This is not in, out in our project area. Uh, I think, you know, first and foremost, so I think this, this graphic is intending to say that there is an importance of the Bay Trail along this shoreline. There's an importance of parking. There's an existing building. And those things are part of a, of a context and documenting that. Um, by no means is this a, um, a, a master plan that lays out all the phasing, um, certainly in this diagram, and, and all the complexity, the technical complexities of, of thinking about adding soft shore beach forms into this hardened riprap, you know, this really doesn't address that, and I don't think we're at a good place to, to really speak to that, um, whether a, a soft shore beach is really feasible or, or not. It's just really not, it's really not determined. There's language that mentions something like that um, in, a longer, um, in a longer document that I think the, the caller, uh, Mr. Threlfall, is, is referencing. But again, it's really outside of our, of our work um, here. So it's, it's just simply outside your site boundary. Correct. Not in your purview. Correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other um, comments from the public? No further comments. Okay. So if there's no one else who would like to comment, we'll move on to the board discussion. For the board discussion section, I'd like to ask everyone except the board members to turn off your cameras so the board can have a focused discussion. So board members, please remember to turn on your microphones uh, when you speak. Okay. Um, staff recommends, as always, that the board frame its remarks of the proposed park, considering the public access objective objectives found in the Commission's public access design guidelines. Additionally, please provide feedback on the proposed public access park project with respect to the Commission's policies on sea level rise, environmental justice, and social equity. Seven objectives for public access are to one, make public access public, two, make public access usable, provide, maintain, and enhance visual access to the bay and the shoreline, maintain and enhance the visual quality of the bay, shoreline, and adjacent developments, provide connections to and continuity along the shoreline, take advantage of the bay setting, and ensure that public access is compatible with wildlife through siting, design, and management strategies. In addition, staff would like the board's advice focused on the following issues. So I'll go over these quickly and then we can um, circle back and just hit these one at a time. Overall design and circulation through the park, signage, interpretive elements and lighting, management and maintenance, including plant palette, special events, um, size location types, et cetera. And uh, finally, the proposed beach design and existing shoreline edges in consideration of their function to park users and rising sea levels. So um, go back to the first item, uh, comments on the overall design and circulation throughout the park, including changes to existing significant park elements as they pertain to the public's invitation to enjoy the waterfront and the southeastern corner of the park. So with that, I will open it up to the group. Would anyone like to kick off? Kristen, please. Um, well, thank you guys so much again for this presentation. And um, thanks for showing us so thoughtfully the changes that you incorporated from the previous uh, discussion. And you know, I think this is a really exciting part of the waterfront for Oakland. And this park will be a real benefit for this neighborhood. Um, 
and I think we can see a lot of clarity as this plan has developed and, and you know, coherence in some of the ways that you guys have worked through circulation and some of those, those things. Um, I wanted to talk, I guess, first related to this first item about the Halperin um, design and this grade separation. Um, I actually think this is an example of an adaptation strategy in action. You know, we often are asking for people to think ahead about adaptation and show us what the sectional change will be. And this is an example where we have an existing design that's going to be adapted. Um, and so I think um, the way that you've dealt with the waterfront access by kind of uh, keeping those three access points from the original Halpern plan is successful. Um, I think that the pergola has enough presence on its own. It doesn't really need this wall kind of anchoring it. I think it kind of holds its own within the, the plan. I think the adjacency next to the playground is actually going to make it really successful. As a youth, I mean, you can imagine families coming here and watching their kids play and having a picnic, and I think that's all really successful. Um, and I also thought that... Um, I think we can get into the circulation stuff. I think both Gary and Stefan have alluded to that. But I think there's a few things to be worked out with circulation of the Bay Trail. It sounds like you've been in conversations about that. Specifically, the bike markings, it does make it look like it's a two-way bike lane. And I think it's that lane separation that does it. And having taking that away and having something that's just a shared path or, you know, and some kind of turbulence markings like triangles or whatever it is that indicates that it's shared and that, that cyclists are not, in fact, privileged. I think giving it the lane makes it look like cyclists are privileged in that space, which is what's confusing about it. Um, and then I had one more comment about events. I'm kind of doing all my things right now. Is that <laughs> can I just, while I'm talking? Okay. Works for me, yeah. All right. Um, the last comment I had was about special events, and there's a list of events in here like weddings and food trucks and you know business retreats and things like that and I was I was having a little bit of trouble seeing like imagining where some of those things would be happening in the plan and I think to the point about access to this park um, it would be helpful a lot of you know when we see parks that are going to have events as part of their kind of regular programming it's helpful to see a plan for which areas would be used by those events and how public access would be maintained. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if this is really the list of events that theater plays and all of these things, like where, where would these things be happening and how would you make sure to maintain access? I think that would be, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if we need to see that specifically, but I think considering that as part of the planning would be helpful to address um, that question and also the comment we heard from the public. Would you like to take on the circulation, Stefan? I'll try. Um, thanks for getting us started off on a good foot there. Um, you know, I, I just along the lines of sort of understanding how we can adapt the Halperin design. Um, one thing I'm sort of thinking about is the addition of the cash and carry site and the fact that if you're coming from Jack London Square, not along the Bay Trail, that sort of the visual connection into the site and down to the water is right now, it's kind of hard to understand or perceive or my experience of being there um, to see beyond the aquatic center. And so one consideration would be, is there a way to kind of consider the vocabulary of the Halpern sort of trellis to the west along the sort of northwestern boundary of the park? How do you sort of define that edge so that you can actually communicate to folks who are coming from the north and west that the, this sort of larger unified park is there? Um, I really like the, the sort of addition of this, the, the ped bike entrance at the northwestern corner. I think that's really great. Um, and I can imagine that that also would be used for folks who are coming to events or activities. So that just suggests like integrating signage into that um, 
framework along that sort of northwestern edge. And I, I don't know how to do that. There's that sort of trellis at the um, pump station entrance. But, you know, there's sort of a way that you maybe could sort of um, build on the character that is in the existing park, but sort of separate that um, in terms of the sort of the character. Uh, so that's sort of one, one thought. Um, the, the second thought, I think, is just building on the how you're delineating the Bay Trail. Um, you know, one idea would be to sort of take the space between the two elbows where you're basically turning to go northbound at the southern end and then turning to go eastbound sort of to back towards Embarcadero um, at the sort of skating rink area and to say that that area is sort of parallel to the um, the pergola maybe could be treated differently in terms of thinking more about a unified extension of the ground plane. Um, I think also sort of that the, the introduction of the sort of crosswalks suggests that they're needed uh, that bicyclists would be traveling so fast on that route that somehow you, and again, I, I'm not sure that that's sort of the correct um, approach at the ground plane for this. I don't think it's needed. Um, and then I think you could sort of extend that and say, um, you know, if you're treating that with a special pavement, could you extend that all the way to the picnic area at the southwest end? Again, it's, it's not clear to me sort of how much you need these markings that suggest um, what you were sort of referring to before. Um, other than that, I think the, the, the development of the spatial framework is really great. I really like sort of what's happening here and just the opportunity to review this after uh, design development, I think is, is, is really beneficial. Thank you. Uh, any comments, Tom, or should I um, continue on? Yeah, I have uh, um, just a few quick comments. Um, I uh, I noticed when right at the beginning of the meeting, Andrea was showing an illustration of this P3 park that was built, and I, I saw there a, a wood deck cutting right across the the trail bike trail, and I thought that was just fine and it indicates yeah it's it's not conducive to high speed and sh it should be that way so the people on bikes can slow down and people in this park really need to slow down and uh, um, maybe if the crosswalk markings so you were Stefan was just mentioning were something like that that extended all the way back to the picnic area and kind of then cut through across the trail but I think mainly uh, the, the elbows the the that the change in pavement is warranted and uh, people should slow down and if there's a little more texture to it that's good as well and up at the plaza 13 as long as it seems as long as there is demarcation of where the bike trail is and it's not then there's an enforceable line for people that are running events i know like at uh, craneway pavilion and Richmond, they have marking just paint on the asphalt where the bike trail is uh, between people in the water and you have to stay out of that for an event. And there has to be a line that the event organizers uh, are going to uh, enforce. So I think that that's, most of this is all kind of uh, well handled. I like the the uh, the raising up of the trail is good. I like getting new trees. I, I actually worry that the section of wall that is remaining is still too high. I mean, four feet on the picnic side, I mean, I know they, they did it that way, but wouldn't it be better if it was like down 12 inches or, or 18 inches further so you have more uh, sense of the water and less being uh, cut off? But I don't know if the historic uh, advisor would, would second that. So I, I basically feel that the plan's pretty well resolved the practical questions that we had. good thought. Um, if that were a seat wall, I think it would be much nicer. And I think it preserves the intent of the original Halpern plan. Um, at the same time, I, I think um, 
you know, keeping the pergola is fantastic. I think the improvements you've, you've made are, are really great. And to the extent that you can maintain the character of that little, um, you know, little jewel in this much larger park that's going to be new and very modern, I think the, the um, interplay between something old and cared for and something which is new uh, would be really good. So even though um, I know the benches are not ex you know, the picnic tables don't work from the accessibility point of view. I guess I would just encourage you to save anything you can and to, if, you know, maybe not every picnic table has to be accessible. I think that, that that's possible also. I think it's usually just a percentage of the furniture has to be, uh, follow those standards. And so, you know, there's this, these comments about the ground plane and certainly the, you know, the, the DG, um, you know, is a much better surface than what in some of the renderings looks like asphalt with um, you know traffic markings on it. So to the extent that something can be done to maintain something textured or something that's not dark uh, in there, I think that would all be great. Um, I think everything looks really good. The you know the bike entry, I think the way you've changed that is is much much better for people entering. So. Um, I don't want to, I think you've done a lot that's great and I don't want to have to go through all of that and keep everybody, um, but, I, but I think the, corn, the southeast corner is so much better. Um, and I just wanted to comment one thing about the uh, trees. You know, sycamores have always been a problem close to the bay because of all the mildew. And although that may have been the original tree, unless there's a variety out there that you think is really, uh, you know, resistant to the mildew, it can be really bad, and I think that also at that time, um, they didn't really know about soil preparation the way we do today. You know, the sycamores that I think Halpern planted on Market Street are a case in point. You know, these twisted dwarf uh, things, you know, are, are really because they, they don't have any soil. You know, it's really compacted. So when, when you raise the grade, you know, I guess the question is what do you do to provide uncompacted soil for those trees, and to do that right, you know, really takes some thought and some some detailing. You know, if you if you use engineered backfill and you raise it up a number of feet and then try and plant in that, you'll have exactly the Market Street uh, situation. So I don't know. Maybe from my point of view, if there if there's a tree that's better, you know, maybe maybe that's worth you know thinking about. Gary, Go ahead, Stephen. Gary, can I ask? Um, just my understanding is that the the planting plan for the remainder of the open space is sort of under under definition or yet to be defined and so there might be an opportunity to talk about the right any recommendations you might have for the planting strategy on the the, the, the sort of larger lawn spaces um yeah well uh i think these guys i i mean obviously um you know drought is a huge thing and you know maintenance is problematic and and i just think that um, you know the old farmer's adage. You know, a uh, hundred dollars in the in the hole and one dollar for the tree is the way to go. I mean, uh, we put beautiful plant materials in terrible growing environments, and it just you know it's not a, not a good thing. But um, you know, I think some people love natives, and I just want to say that I support that. But if you don't have native soil, it's hard to have native trees. So I would think about that. If you don't have good soil, then you know I wouldn't do that just to please the crowd and then have it have it go south. But but buckeye trees and certain kinds of oaks I think are, are pretty tough. And, um, but I, I trust you guys to, to work that out. Yeah. Um, those are pretty much all my comments. Is there any other um, final well, just summary? One, one last Can thing is I, I feel like it's uh, they've responded to the question about the uh, extension of the bay trail through the area that's not in their scope. So I feel like that's enough. I mean, there's not in the, they can't detail it anymore without having having uh, been commissioned to design it. So it's clear where it's running, where it's intended to go. Um, I'm personally satisfied with what they've done in these plans to clarify that. I think there was a question too about where would there be access for kayaks and small craft like and that. And they show that, the master plan. I think. In the uh, in the ma that master plan drawing I'm looking at, which is page four, or the diagram just before page five. Uh, 
I, I mean, I was wondering if the existing public docks could be used for boating access. That seems like a, a obvious answer to the question, but maybe but there's probably something I'm missing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The project proponent will have an opportunity to respond after the board comments. Yeah. So um, you can yes. address Very it at shortly. that point. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to tick through these items that we're supposed to cover to make sure uh, we, we hit everything. So changes to existing significant park elements as they pertain to the public's invitation to enjoy the waterfront. Southeastern corner of the park. I think we've sort of addressed that. Uh, does anyone have comments on signage, interpretive elements, and lighting? Um, mm -hmm. just, just one last point on this bike question. I think you have a choice to make whether there's a dedicated bike lane that's painted for bikes to ride through or whether it's a shared use path. And I think if it's, it's my understanding that if it's a dedicated bike path, it would need to be wider probably. Um, in order to facilitate the two-way bike traffic and a walking area. So just something to consider as you think about signage for that. Uh, any other comments on lighting, interpretive elements? Um, I think maybe we'll, we'll leave that one. I think the more subtle you know it is the better and the more it kind of blends in. Um, item number three, management and maintenance, including plant pallet selection. I think we hit that. Special events, size, location, types, and frequency of events. Balancing events with public access, event programming areas, areas of closure, and access routes. Anyone have comments on those? I, as you consider thinking about um, public events, or pri private events, privatizing, uh, using the public space for private events. Um, you know, I think um, sources of revenue for parks are really important for maintenance. And so as long as public access is maintained, they'd be able to get through the park. And in some areas, especially like, you know, the beach or the waterfront, I think that um, those are important areas to maintain that public access. But other areas like lawns and um, plazas and things like that that aren't right at the waterfront seem like great opportunities to be able to offer those events. Great. And finally, um, proposed beach design, existing shoreline edges in consideration of their function to park users and rising sea levels. Wrap-up comments, I think we hit that lightly, but um, I don't have any comments on that. Um, I think we were looking at, we were curious about the, the variety of edge conditions um, and how different user groups would be using them, um, you know, Will the gravel beach provide water access, watercraft access, um, you know, adaptation considerations for the steps, you know, as water rises? Um, th those were the types of questions we were discussing as staff that we thought the board might want to comment on. You know, we've seen steps into the bay that often get climbed over with algae and become sort of like an attractive nuisance. I think the Port of San Francisco calls it where they don't really want to provide access because they don't want to maintain cleaning off the algae. Um, I think that's something to consider. I was also just looking at the that area along the waterfront. I see that you've kind of expanded the, the walkable area behind the bollards. There's the steps and the bollards and then you've added an area for walking. It may be that, uh, you know, some benches in that planted area would be a good way to provide seating along that edge that's a little bit more accessible. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if there's materials that are better than others for, you know, minimizing
optimizing algae on steps or something like that that we could recommend. But I think it's nice to provide the access. It often just doesn't, you know, get used or often gets roped off. Um, so I don't have any answers on that. But it's just something that I think um, does happen. And then just in terms of the craft, I mean, I think in this larger master plan question, as staff is reviewing the permit, I, I agree that considering this beach area as a kayak launch, it's very far. It would be a long way to walk with a kayak. So if access can be provided closer to the parking lot on one of these docks or some other way, that seems like it would be a better way to meet that small craft access requirement of the master plan. Also, I, I'm looking at this master plan and there's uh, actually three uh, public uh, boat launch facilities and they're gonna remain. Um, and I don't know which of them might be adaptable to what uh, some of the public comment was asking for, but it seems like that would be, if, if the whole park is gonna be basically transformed and then maybe some repair to those facilities and some adaptations would be in line as well. Uh, I don't know what state of dilapidation they're in because I ha haven't been on the site, but uh, does anybody know? I think we can have the project proponents respond to that. Okay. Great. I do not have any further comment. Uh, and it looks like um, that should wrap it up. So. I think the proponent uh, is invited to respond. If you want to make a brief uh, comment. Sure, John Gibbs, WRT, and Jake will uh, chime in here as well. And City of Oakland project manager Christine Reed is also on the line. Should but I think I think we can handle it. Um, yeah, just thanks for your yeah your your continued um, feedback and and efforts here uh, about the public shoreline around the bay and um, we share your enthusiasm for uh, what this park is is doing for recreation needs in the city of Oakland and the adjacent communities um, certainly the the attention and the importance that you've noted from Embarcadero in terms of views and access into this park um, but I think also just the Bay Trail and the shoreline experience I think you know there's there's an effort not to go overboard with um, the vehicular entrances to this uh, to this park, but in fact, the contiguous Bay Trail and the access from Jack London Square along the waterfront is, I think, is is actually equally important. Um, on the bike striping, um, I think there's you know it's a it's a bit of a art and a science there. I mean, I think we're all on the same page in terms of the goal. This is a this is a shared use facility. We're following the guidelines. The width will allow us to leave it completely open, which is actually the majority of, of what we're doing. Um, it's, it's unmarked, there is no center stripe. Um, in fact, the master plan drawing shows that, that's not the intent as we got into the details. So mostly it's, it's 20 feet clear, sometimes it's 17 feet clear. Um, we wanna work with Lee and the city of Oakland and dig into that a little bit more. We do think that we have to pay attention to where there's crossings. We just wanna make sure this is safe. We want to encourage regional cyclists to be able to use this facility reasonably. We also want folks that are just out walking, birding, whatever they're, they're strolling along this waterfront to also be safe. There's a, there's are a number of, of, uh, of precedents that we'll be pulling from and that we already have pulled from, uh, but there's also lots of precedents. And so we actually really wanna make sure uh, we land this uh, correctly. And, and as I mentioned, we'll, we'll be following up with Lee to, to dig into that. But we're starting with the right width. We're starting with the right, uh, the right goals, and, and we'll fine tune the paint just a little bit. Uh, in terms of events, uh, yeah, there's definitely a um, a, a goal on the sa on the part of the city um, recreation department to be able to do things out here. Um, there's also you know limits in terms of the adjacent residences in terms of really large events. So the list of events is is intended to be. Um, just examples of maybe a little bit more the scale of things. You'll notice, you know, giant rave festival is not listed there. It's excluded. Um, uh, food trucks, roller skating, uh, disco in, in the plaza, you know, it definitely is. 
the plaza design, which again, we're not seeing on screen right now, which maybe you'd want to switch that back. Um, the, the plaza design is, is very well connected to the lawn, and there's been attention to maintaining um, that sort of wide connection so that events could be separate, they could flow back and forth, there's different lawn areas, so trying to create as much flexibility because there is, honestly, there is not a detailed roadmap for what those events are. We just want to maintain public access, shoreline access, uh, and bay trail connectivity regardless of, of what that event might, might be. Um, I think just in terms of the bulkhead and, and adaptation there and, and, and the, the algae, uh, you know, currently the lower areas of the of that bulkhead wall are are inundated. There's not a big algae issue. It's more about the the, the flotsam and jetsam that sort of stacks up there, and you know, it's at the higher tides. Over time, though, I think we would start to see you know perhaps even greater inundation. So that might be something that the city is going to have to watch for in terms of slipperiness. Um, whether that's something that this project needs to add, we're really not touching that that bulkhead structure. Um, presently, but the adaptation pathway in the future is to evaluate it for weight and, and seismic um, stability, which is not totally done. Adding an, you know, another series of uh, bulkheads on top of it is going to take a little bit more technical work, which is another reason why we're leaving that for a future day uh, in terms of extending those, uh, that bulkhead structure. And the idea of, of putting a couple benches along there, that, that's something we'll take a look at. Great. Um, do you feel compelled yeah. to summarize the discussion, Andrea? No, I think I think we have pretty good notes um, on our side. Um, the main question I have is, um, you know, whether or not the board feels comfortable with uh, the advice that you've given. You can direct staff to continue working with the project proponents. Um, yes, as they that move forward, seems very much um, the way to go. If anyone. Uh, has another thought, please please chime in, but I think it, it's looking fantastic, and um, I think you can handle it from here. It's in construction drawings, so I think it's probably not the time for um, changing course. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. I think with that, we can take a five-minute break. Yeah, so we'll take a five-minute break. Um, uh, board member Bob Vitalio will be rejoining the meeting for the next project review, and we'll get that set up. And we'll be back in about five minutes. Thanks. Great. Thank you to the proponents. Yeah. Thanks for. No. Okay. Are we uh, are we ready? We are ready. Okay. Um, so we're gonna um, continue the meeting. Uh, Bob Battaglio has rejoined the board uh, for this next project review, um, and I will hand it back over to. Acting Chair Strain. Okay, thank you, and welcome back, Bob. We'll now begin our review of agenda item number five, which is the second review of a life science and office development at 1200 to 1340 Old Bayshore Highway in Burlingame, San Mateo County. And to remind you of the project review order, there will be a staff introduction, uh, then a project proponent presentation, board clarifying questions, then a period of public comment, board discussion and summary, and then a response uh, from the proponent. So with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Catherine Pan, who will introduce the project. Permit analyst, Catherine Pan. All right, thank you, Acting uh, Chair String. I'll try to get as close to this as possible. Uh, and good evening, board members. I'm Catherine Pan, a Principal Shoreline Development Analyst at BCDC, and I'll be introducing this project. Before I do, I would like to remind the project team and staff to please turn on your video when you're speaking or answering questions. And when you're not actively engaged with the board, please turn off your video and mute your microphone so that we minimize distractions on screen. And this is the second review of the Peninsula Crossing Project in the city of Burlingame in San Mateo County. The board previously reviewed this project this summer on June 13th, 2022. Right, the proposed project is located at 1200 to 1340 Old Bayshore Highway, where it intersects with Airport Boulevard. It's sandwiched between Highway 101 and the Bay, about a mile south of San Francisco International Airport. 
It's in the city's Bayfront area, which has been locally designated as a regional recreation and business destination. Uh, much of the surrounding development in this area is commercial or industrial, but to the south you can find recreational facilities in the Anvil Lagoon. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge that the majority of this land uh, in this area was once water and historic tidal flats located near Sosson, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone. We offer gratitude to the indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the bountiful natural resources of the Bay Area. So I'm going to share again some of the site context to refresh your memory about the project location. Uh, the site is located among an existing network of public access and recreation facilities. Existing parks are shown here outlined in blue and existing segments of the Bay Trail are shown in red. This northern segment of the Bay Trail uh, leading north of the site um, connects the coastline up to the airport and the southern segment continues on past the lagoon. Uh, the site is about 12 acres in size and is developed with hotel and commercial uses. Staff visited the southern portion of the site during the day on a Friday this past May, and here are some of the site photos from that visit. Uh, one of the key natural features of the site that you'll be hearing about is Easton Creek, which flows west to east into the bay. And at the southern portion of the site, there is a small tidal channel, sometimes referred to in the staff report and exhibits as the muted wetland. Uh, and on the bay side, the site borders a partially submerged parcel that contains most of the shoreline, which is rocky and muddy in this area. That parcel is under different ownership and is not part of the project site. Existing public access uh, on the site includes informal access to the adjacent, adjacent shoreline parcel. Um, you can cross over the lawn and scramble down uh, the rocks to uh, walk along the shore. And then here's what our community vulnerability mapping tool showed us about the area. The site is in a census block group that's identified as having low social vulnerability and lower contamination vulnerability. Social vulnerability indicators in the 70th percentile include percentage of renters and non-US citizens. Uh, contamination vulnerability in this area is related to potential groundwater contamination and impaired water bodies, both measured in the 80th percentile as well as proximity to solid waste and hazardous waste facilities, though to a lesser degree. And then regarding potential sea level rise, using current site elevations, this map shows what 24 inches of sea level rise would look like if the site remained unchanged. By uh, using the Ocean Protection Council's 2018 sea level rise guidance, 24 inches of sea level rise is equivalent to the mean higher high water level under the medium to high risk aversion slash high emission scenario at mid-century. At this level, there is some potential for overtopping on site as indicated by the red line at the tidal channel, as well as some flooding along the channel and creek. And this map shows what 66 inches of sea level rise would look like at the site if it was unchanged. This roughly corresponds to the mean high or high water level at 2090 in the medium to high risk aversion slash high emission scenario as well as the 100-year storm condition at mid-century. In this scenario, nearly the entire site would be flooded with overtopping occurring at both the creek and tidal channel. In fact, the flooding at the project site would be part of a much larger flooding impact that would affect most of the surrounding shoreline. So as much as it's a site-specific issue here, it's a regional one as well. Um, and the City of Burlingame Zoning Ordinance establishes requirements for new construction within commercial and industrial zoning districts within the sea level rise overlay area, which is shown in yellow here on the city's map of future conditions. Uh, the project site is subject to these requirements, which include that the lowest building finished floor elevation of new development shall be at least three feet above the FEMA based flood elevation at the time the project application is complete. And because the property fronts the bay, new construction at the site must include shoreline infrastructure where the top is above the FEMA base flood elevation. The ordinance also contains provisions for development along creeks in the area. For properties with frontage on Easton Creek, a minimum buffer zone of 35 feet from the top of Creek Bank is required to accommodate and maintain future infrastructure and a public access trail. 
Um, so now let's touch briefly on some of the topics of the DRB's discussion from the June 13th meeting. I'll give a brief summary, and I believe the project proponents will be talking in more detail about what they heard from that review and how they responded with the design. In June, DRB members pointed out a concern with the degree to which the buildings and parking structures resided within the shoreline band, both facing the bay and on either side of Easton Creek, causing those spaces to become pinched. The board urged the project proponents to consider solutions that would allow the buildings to be pulled back, such as reducing or phasing the parking areas. In the South Gateway area, board members suggested that the project proponents consider how the paving and siting of the cafe seating and bay trail areas might lead to user conflicts, since some of those uses seem to overlap or flow into one another. For the bay trail and bridge over Easton Creek, board members asked the project proponents to consider that the finished trail is likely to be popular among both cyclists and pedestrians, and that greater widths would be best to safely accommodate all potential users. This was in response to the proposed trail width, which varied between 16 and 18 feet throughout the site. The board also heard a public comment recommending wire, wider trailed widths and a less angular alignment. A tongue twister. Uh, the board was interested in understanding the public experience where the building access areas, or public access areas interacted with the buildings and ground floor facades. Uh, one concern raised was that the public spaces, particularly around the building entrances, could feel like extensions of the lobbies or anterooms for private spaces. Another was that some of the view corridors appeared more utilitarian and could feel unwelcoming to the public. The board urged the project proponents to find design solutions to make the public spaces feel more inviting. And lastly, the board was concerned that all the public shoreline parking proposed for the project would be located inside a parking structure, worrying that it might be confusing or difficult for the public to find and use, and the public might not understand that the structure was open to them. The board urged the project proponents to find ways to ensure that public parking would be easy to find and access. So before we introduce the project proponents, I'd like to quickly summarize the questions in the staff report that we'd like the board to consider in your review. First, please consider how this project meets the public access objectives provided in BCDC's public access design guidelines. Then staff has identified some specific questions we'd like to ask the board about the design at this stage. And these are, one, do the project revisions adequately address the concerns raised at the June 13th DRB meeting? Two, are there additional improvements that could improve the public access experience along the shoreline and the creek? Three, does the planting plan provide habitat value? And are there any important considerations for ensuring that the planting areas are successful at varying water levels? Uh, and four, are the public access areas appropriately designed to be resilient and adaptive to sea level rise in balance with ensuring high quality public access opportunities? Uh, and now I want to check to see if the board has any clarifying questions for me on anything that was presented in this introduction. Any comments? Questions, Bob or Tom? Apparently not. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, now I'll just introduce the project team to tell you more about the proposal. Today we have Virginia Calkins and Seth Bland from Divco West. Kevin Conjurer and Justin Aff from CMG, Ben Micus and Brian Shiles from WRNS Studio, and Dilip Trevetti from Moffitt and Nickel here in person, and Steve Rottenborn from HT Harvey on Zoom. And now I'll pass it over to Virginia to tell you more about the project. I'm Virginia Hawkins of Divco West, and joining me here today is Seth Bland on the Divco West team. And we're really excited to be here. Um, we're, we're grateful for the feedback that you guys provided in June, and we're excited to present a meaningfully improved project. Uh, Catherine already mentioned the team members here. You'll be hearing from some of them directly, others available for questions if you have any specifics to their areas of expertise. 
most fundamentally at Peninsula Crossing, we are creating nearly a quarter mile of new Bay Trail where none exists. So we'll connect the Burlingame Bay front to the broader network of regional trails. The site is central to Burlingame, but has experienced little investment to date. It consists primarily of paved services. Some of them are eroding into the water. When we visit the site, we inevitably see hotel guests from across the street wandering, looking for access to the bay. We see huge potential to celebrate this bay frontage, infuse the site with nature, and open it to the public. Tonight, I'd like to spend a few minutes recapping the thoughtful feedback we heard in the last meeting, highlighting how our new design responds to the feedback and to the seven objectives, and then I'll turn it over to the design team to go through the design in more detail. What we heard, we heard the importance of consistent and clear bay trail width and giving it an expression that makes it feel public. We heard helpful ideas on how to expand and improve the public nature of the space along the shoreline and the creek. We heard reactions to the visual prominence of the parking garages and the need for clear public parking. And lastly, we heard comments on how the public space knits into nearby access paths and how it could feel more welcoming to the public. Over the last several months, we've introduced significant design improvements based on those comments, based on subsequent conversations with BCDC staff, and based on prioritizing these seven objectives. I'll run through them quickly in, in our interpretation before the design team gives the project tour. Number one, make public access public. We're building nearly five acres of new publicly accessible open space, and we're committing to helping the public get there with public parking, safe bike trails, and a new bike share. We're also investing in a publicly available free shuttle from BART and Caltrain. Number two, make public access usable. Public space at Peninsula Crossing is intentionally programmed. For example, we have two new public retail cafes, a new picnic grove, and outdoor fitness equipment, all distinctly separated from building lobbies to ensure the public feels welcome. Three, provide, maintain, and enhance visual access to the bay and the shoreline. By pulling the buildings even further away from Easton Creek and the Southern Tidal Marsh, we create nature corridors with visual connection to the bay. We originally tried to achieve the city's vision, which is a 3.0 FAR, but by backing down from that density and achieving scale with height, we're creating a meaningful ground plane and a site that's porous to views of the bay. Since June, we've reduced the project an additional 40,000 square feet, so that it is now almost 150,000 square feet smaller than the potentially allowed, all in aid of speaking more directly to BCDC goals while balancing other critical project objectives. Number four, maintain and enhance the visual quality of the bay, shoreline, and adjacent development. We're transforming a landscape of parking lots and dilapidated buildings into a finished park with trails and views of the water. Five, provide connections and continuity along the shoreline. The new Bay Trail provides a critical Bay Trail continuity while new sidewalks create a web of trails helping draw the public to the Bay with safe bike and pedestrian connections. Six, take advantage of the Bay setting. The Bay view and fresh air become focal points of public programming, including the picnic grove and cafe seating. New habitat responds to the tidally influenced ecosystem. Seven, Ensure that the public access is compatible with wildlife through siting, design, and management strategies. Peninsula Crossing infuses the site with native habitat where barren land wallows today. Drought-tolerant plantings promote long-term resilience and create habitat for many animal species. I like that you guys picked seven. It's like the seven dwarfs or so. I don't know. It's a good number. It's a good number. I'd now like to introduce Brian Childs, founding partner of WRNF, to walk through our evolved building design. Thank you, Gina. And since I'm a Luddite, which one am I, am I advancing with? Down. Got it. Got it. You know, and I, that, that sort of menu bar would be great if it were gone, but I think if I try to do that, the world will end. It will not go well. How's that? Is that good? Okay. So thanks, Virginia. Um, Virginia set the table, uh, reset the goals and objectives for the project. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our specific changes that we've made since you guys saw the project last. And then Kevin Conger, 
is going to take a deep dive into the experience of this place. Um, so that's going to be the, the bulk of what we talk about tonight. But before we get to the changes that we made, I wanted to do just a really quick, like two minutes at the most, reset of the architecture because you're going to see buildings and images. And we probably haven't talked about it much. Not going to talk about it a lot tonight because it's still in development. But, you know, the buildings, we feel, um, in their language, in their public presentation, are direct response to this amazing uh, context and site. And the site, as we see it, is, the, is very reductive and elemental. There's the sky, there's the bay, there's the shoreline. It's like a Milton Avery painting. You know, these things come together very simply to make a powerful uh, and delineated context. And we think the buildings are playing to that context in the following way. They're really quite simple uh, relative to their, their basic organization and idea of language. And that is that there's a bottom. The lower two floors of the building are a base, and they tie to the land, they join with the land, they join with the public realm, and they modulate that public realm for scale and experience. There's a lot of ins and outs, pushes and pulls, places to be, um, and a real framing of the public realm. And the materiality of the lower two parts of the building will join with the landscape, warm, haptic, tactile materials. So that is a, that's a set. Above, and there's a, a kind of horizon, you know, at the third floor, flat, uh, third floor level there. Above, we're trying to make these buildings as ephemeral as possible, so joining with the sky. They're more planar. Uh, they are trying to sparkle a little bit. Uh, with frit patterns and glass, we're trying to make uh, a very ephemeral kind of presentation that runs through the sky. So I just wanted to do that same concept from the other side. I want to do that really quickly just to kind of reset why the buildings are organized the way they are relative to their language. Now we're going to talk about how the buildings are organized relative to placemaking, the public realm, uh, et cetera. All right, so I'm going to go through some of the changes that we've made in the last month or two since June 13th. Um, and what you're seeing here in red is the footprint of the five buildings as they were on June 13th, and in white, uh, the footprints of the buildings as they are now. I'm going to go through, the, through those changes. We've made a lot of changes, um, and we think all the, of them are in service to the public realm and to better placemaking and better connection uh, to the bay and a better experience uh, for visitors and those who are working here. So thing one, <clears throat> the buildings went on a diet. Uh, from top to bottom, uh, they went on a diet. So what you're seeing here is that both flanking Easton Creek and to the South Marsh, the lower two floors of the building, that base that I was just referring to, has been pulled in. So the red arrows point to the direction of pulling in, and the brighter green spaces are a space that is now part of the public realm or part of landscaping and part of the landscape that used to be building footprints. Similarly, uh, in the higher parts of the building, uh, flanking Easton Creek, we have pulled back 11 feet so that that, that sort of view corridor is 11 feet wider and to the South Marsh, we're five, five foot six inches wider. So in the upper parts of the building, uh, there's also a pullback. The parking structures have pulled back uh, from the Bay Trail and from the Bay. You can see the number, 17 six to the north and four, foot, four feet six inches to the south. So all of the buildings went on a diet. The Bay Trail, <clears throat> we heard comments about the Bay Trail uh, relative to its geometry and ultimately it's experience. So what we've tried to do here is make a much more sinuous path, a much more natural path with focusing the bends in the Bay Trail to great views um, and sort of smoothing out and we think making a more natural uh, and good experience for those who are on the Bay Trail. And we have, uh, we've made the Bay Trail 20 feet wide in, in the entire project. We have added uh, a few uh, public amenities um, and, and sort of tuned one up. I'll do the tune up first. Uh, the cafe, which is in the southern, can you see my cursor? Yes, this cafe, which has always been there, uh, we adjusted, rotated, and softened that corner, uh, got better uh, sort of uh, uh, separation between the Bay Trail uh, and the cafe terrace. What is new are several things. From the north, there's a new picnic area uh, to the north side of Easton Creek. We've added a second cafe just to the south of Easton Creek. You can see there in the middle building. We have added in the, public, in the southern parking structure 
uh, public restrooms, a hydration station, and an airplane viewing platform on the top of that structure. We also heard uh, about some of the, uh, the, the public spaces perhaps being too closely aligned with building entrances, and maybe they would feel appropriated by the, by the private side. So we've, we've scattered uh, the, the public amenities out a little bit and actually rearranged some lobbies to get them a little bit further away uh, from those public amenities. Uh, and also to uh, sort of animate the, um, the, the base, the old Bayshore side of the, of the project. <clears throat> we think we've clarified uh, the main circulation. There's a much clearer, we think, a much clearer hierarchy of circulation now um, with the, the two paths which flank Easton Creek and the path at the South Marsh connecting to the Bay Trail being clearly delineated as the primary paths. And there are still paths uh, the more minor paths here and there that will have public access, but those are service roads. But, so we see those as being much more downplayed and those major connections between Old Bay Shore and the, and the Bay Trail being much more amplified. As for the parking, uh, the public parking, which is the ground level of the southern parking structure, could be entered from either entrance into the parking structure. We would see uh, very clear signing on the old Bayshore side um, to make that very, very clear. And that public parking would be intuitive in the way that you would find it. You would find it the way you would go into a parking structure uh, with good signage. And that, that public parking is directly um, accessible to the Bay Trail there. So this is a summary uh, of what I just went through. I'm not going to go back through every one of these. This is a pass off to Kevin who's now going to dive in and really talk about this experience of place. Thank you. Um, arrow down, right? Great. Okay. So the, uh, this, I'm not going to go through all this entire legend. This is the plan that's in your package. But what I'm going to do is um, zoom in and take us on a side tour. I'm going to start on the south uh, edge of the project and work our way north uh, up along the Bay Trail and then <clears throat> down to uh, Eastern Creek and then uh, down to Old Bay Shore and then back down Eastern Creek the other way and then up uh, to the Bay Trail to the north of the site. So starting out here on the southern end, this is the what was referred to earlier as the muted tidal wetlands. It does get some tidal action now, and, there, and it is a wetland. It, that will increase uh, as sea level rise comes up, and so, which will be great. So this will be a more thriving wetland area, and we've um, created plenty of space around it so that wetland can expand in the future and become a, a bigger habitat area. Uh, there is a seating area number three there, which is a terrace seating area that you can uh, get down to and look over this wetland and out to the bay. It's big enough that school groups or families or you know whatever any kind of group can um, come and and hang out here. Number uh, two is a plaza that's along Old Bayshore. There, Bayshore that's big enough for events, small markets, food trucks, uh, things like that as a public space. Um, and there are what you see is number five are these seating elements that are between the building and the um, the Bay Trail, so that there's additional pedestrian circulation um, along the building, and those are also um, stormwater planters for treating some of the water that's coming off the building. And then uh, at number seven is the outdoor seating area for the public cafe that's separated from the circulation on the Bay Trail by a little two wall planter. Uh, you can see the paving is different between the areas that are um, along the building and in the Bay Trail to um, delineate where the Bay Trail is and so uh, um, as a mixed-use trail, so cyclists and so forth will know um, where to be. The, this is a view um, at showing sort of the gateway of this wetland area from the Bayshore side, and then an axon showing the arrangement of all those different components I just described, including this event plaza, flexible space in the front, dropping down into the southern side where there's this stone seating area. This is indicative, I think, of a general material approach where we're trying to be as natural as possible, stone, PG, wood, concrete where we need to, um, keep it warm, keep it natural, reduce carbon footprint as much as possible. As we come around the other side along the Bay Trail and see the cafe, 
and this little sort of viewing, viewing promontory that sticks out on the other side of the Bay Trail. <clears throat> I just want to say one thing that, that Brian didn't mention is, which I think has been a real improvement in this project, is as the architecture has evolved further and been refined and more developed with all those kind of ins and outs, I think it's really starting to engage with the public realm and interact with the public realm in a way that is, is exciting and, and integrated and supporting this publicness of the public realm. And you'll see that you know, in all the views as we move around this, um, including in the parking structures. So coming around the bend here for this next segment, um, we're going to start um, on looking at number six there, which is a fitness lot. Then we'll move down a little further and look at number two on the bay side of the Bay Trail, which is a discovery play area, and then drop down to number three, which is this gravel beach um, zone, and then, and then move down to the end. So here we are um, looking at the, at the fit lot on the left. Um, there, there are some segments along the Bay Trail where we're close enough to the water that we need to uh, have um, some a guardrail in, some, in a few zones. So this is showing what that looked like. It's also showing the alignment changes in the Bay Trail that Brian showed in the diagrams. And so you know, that, that the idea is to just make it a little bit more uh, cinematic as you're moving along so the view is changing and your eye is moving more through the landscape which I think is going to be more interesting. Moving further down with the discovery play area on the right. And then as you move through that discovery play area, this is the um, gravel beach. There's an accessible ramp, so you're able to get down there. Um, and again, all pretty natural, make, really making it feel like it's embedded in this restored um, coastal landscape. Now, if you were to go across the Bay Trail and into the parking garage, there's a public restroom, but there's also an elevator that takes you up to this public viewing um, platform, which is up at the top floor, which will be uh, really cool for viewing airplanes. But it's also a really neat way to just experience the bay and look out over the water and understand uh, this portion of the bay. So we think this will be really interesting. There'll be interpretive signage, art, those types of things to help people um, understand and enjoy what it is that they're looking at. As we come around to Easton Creek, um, we have clarified the circulation, uh, moved some of the seating areas a little bit further away from the lobbies, but I think more importantly developed the lobby architecture and the, and the public realm in front of the lobbies so that I think it's much more clear and, and much more successful about where the buildings are, where the building entrances are, and where the uh, other parts of the public realm are. So I'm going to show you a few views of that. Um, but first, looking at the bay side, you see, I think, the impact of the new cafe that's been added on the south side of Eastern Creek on the north corner of that building. And, and then on the other side across Eastern Creek is a uh, picnic area, and there's, a, there's like a little seating terrace. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of that. But you can also see at the second floor of the building are these terraces that are not public, but they're pulled back and they're, they're spaces that can be occupied. And I think all of those things together activate and make the architecture feel really public and like it's supporting the public realm in a way that I think is super positive. Now in the foreground on the left is the, the um, restored habitat area that it will remain at a lower elevation so that future sea level rises will come up and inundate that and, and um, it will adapt into um, tidal wetlands, which is going to be really needed around the bay uh, for sea level rise adaptation because we're going to lose a lot of the current wetlands we have. Um, they're going to become too deep. And you might remember in the last time we had a boardwalk that went out over that wetland area, but upon further consideration and, and discussing it with groups like the Sierra Club, we really felt that we were afraid that that might compromise the habitat value of this area, particularly for birds. And so while it was a kind of neat and interesting experience to walk along that boardwalk, we think that it will be a better experience to have birds there and be able to look at the birds from the uh, adjacent uh, bay trail there. So that was an adjustment that we made. Here's another view just panning around a little bit further south and getting down lower. So I think it really shows um, that integration of the architecture that I was talking about along the cafe side. And then here's a view out over that overlook at right at the mouth of Eastern Creek. We've been working with Steve Rottenborn from H.G. Harvey around um, the 
uh, target habitats and plant species for these areas, and I'll show you a bit of that toward the end. On the north side of Easton Creek, there's also a way to get down to the Bay Edge. There's a, a sloped walkway that is fully accessible that gets down, and there's stairway slash seating terrace, so um, folks can gather and look out over the bay. And you also see the new bridge that's being built over Easton Creek, which again is just another fantastic way to experience the um, nature in Easton Creek. Backing out to Old Bay Shore and um, looking down the other way, you start to see the, um, the clarification of that circulation and building entrance at the lobby. <clears throat> and you can also start to see the way the lobby um, recedes. And it's, it's both, it's both that, that horizon and the architecture that Brian was talking about. It really lifts the building up. But the lobby is actually then becomes more transparent and recedes back in. And I think what's going to be great is that you will see the activities in the lobby, which was great because it's going to help activate the public realm and make it feel safe and eyes on the, the street and that type of thing. But we've taken a look at the circulation and the paving materials and so forth to really try and differentiate where there's a building entrance from the way you would move through the public realm if you weren't going into the building entrance um, with the additional width that got added into this area. It's working um, a lot better. So in this example, there's two paths when you start to move along the um, north side of the south side of Eastern Creek. One that will stay up high, or you could veer off to the left and drop down a little bit lower where there's a seating area that um, uh, looks across the creek. And then as you move further down to the cafe, um, again, the way that the architecture is starting to uh, engage with the public realm and, and support it. So then jumping out and taking a little tour of the uh, northern stretch, um, there's a, a um, picnic flexible lawn, picnic lawn flexible lawn that's been added into the project here. And um, then just um, ab above that and to the right is a um, picnic area and, a, and then a seating terrace. And you can see that seating terrace here. Uh, and again, the way that this the architecture lifts up with that second floor terrace that's, that's underneath there that, um, again, isn't public, but I think it's going to really help accommodate uh, this entire space. And then <clears throat> pulling back to the, we're really at the, at the northern edge of the site here. You see the um, bike share, which is right there. As soon as you come into the site, you'll be able to pick up a bike and um, go for a ride or, or uh, return your bike. It's in front of the parking garage. and I. I you can also start to see how the even the parking garage architecture has been uh, developed enough to where it's really helping to um, animate the public realm and feel inviting and um, not just be big plain walls that are coming down to the ground. So the sea level rise approach, as, as um, you know, we need to elevate this up to roughly elevation 17 on the Bayshore side and a little bit lower on Easton Creek. But we did not want to elevate the entire site up to that level because, um, as I said before, we need low areas for any future tidal marshes. So we kept we kept some of the um, edge of the, of the bay down low so it will flood with um, future sea level rise and create a different type of habitat. These sections show that where the red dashed line is existing and then um, the proposed bridge on top of that. And that is all to sponsor a certain um, type of target habitats, which um, HP Harvey has been advising us on, which is shown here. Um, and um, those are um, supported by these um, plant species, almost entirely native. There are some plants that are more salt tolerant, like the ones that are on the top row there, the Bayland Transition Planning Zone. <coughs> and as sea level rise come up in the future, those types of species will be the ones that will start to um, dominate and and spread out the most while some of the other ones with future innovation when not as salt tolerant will start to um, proceed. Um, tree species are um, mostly native, but not entirely. Um, certainly trying to pick things that grow well right along the bay in these types of conditions, um, diversifying the plant palette enough to avoid some of the um, vulnerabilities with Phytophthora and other um, threats. And the overall materials, as I said earlier, are uh, natural as much as possible, stone, wood, PG, concrete where we need it. Um, and there is a signage program that is being um, developed that will include wayfinding, wayfinding 
but also um, interpretive elements to tell the story of the site and public art. And uh, Virginia, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. So quick nuts and bolts, given the scale of the project, it will be phased. Um, that being said, we've heard loud and clear the importance of the Bay Trail, and so we're committed to building Bay Trail continuity in some form in the first phase. Um, overall, we're just we're really excited about the opportunity to invest significantly in transforming the Bayfront, and we want to thank you for the opportunity to, to present this project, for your feedback that got us to this point, and for the potential for this to look really different in the future. So we welcome your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. That's um, really super clear and beautiful um, drawings and really appreciate how you've gone through what you heard and how you responded. So that's, a, that's fantastic. Um, so we're going to take some time for clarifying questions. Uh, there's a lot here. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> but I, I will um, let, let others um, take a pass first. Um, would anyone, is anyone dying to start? Bob has his hand raised. OK. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, uh, Gary. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. And I really like um, a lot of elements of this project. Um, but my question is, have you thought about connecting the living shorelines uh, components to the existing bay level? In other words, the, um, the wetlands and the gravel beach are perched. Uh, uh, above the existing bay, typical water levels above the tides, I think in anticipation of, of future sea level rise and, you know, in recognition of the space uh, constraints. But I was wondering if it, if it, if you considered uh, trying to connect um, to the existing bay water levels and perhaps have uh, an adaptation for the living shorelines, you could perch them in the future or something like that. It's a, it's a good question, and I'm not sure I'm answering it fully, but one clarification is that we actually don't own the shoreline. So the blue dotted line here represents our boundary, um, and, and so we don't own anything that touches the existing bay. So it sort of, in some respects, um, limits our ability to have a totally living shoreline strategy. In other respects, some of that area is um, sort of naturally planted material that I think will serve as some erosion protection for our site, but we're not touching it ourselves. I don't know, Kevin, do you have anything you want to add? How does that work that you don't, you said you don't own that property, you don't have the ability to do work there? It's not ours yet. There's a third party um, individual who owns it. The little strip along the shore? Yeah. Oh. He owns, he owns like oh. 110 acres of land in, in the bay. And so our property line- you In know, the it, bay. It, it, yeah. it yeah. ends right here. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, let's um, probably have more discussion on that later, but thank you. Go ahead, Kristen. <laughs> he said he had a bunch, so. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, just a question on the um, plan view. It was hard to see if there are those um, access ways that go to the water between the buildings. Yes. Some of them look like they might have sidewalks, and some of them look like they might not. And I just was wondering if they're, like, what's the sort of street section there? I'm trying to get you to a better site plan. But um, there are, protect I mean, you can access it through sidewalks. It's just not an encouraged path of circulation. Like I see, uh, like I see on the one between the South Building and the South Parking Structure, it looks like there's a sidewalk on one side. I can't tell if it goes into the building on the other side. And then I can't tell if there's any sort of pedestrian access on the one between South and Center. And then between North and North parking, it looks like there's a sidewalk on one side, but not the other. Can and you just could you go through it? You. Okay. Well, it's you. What, what? Or go ahead. I was going to say, you just got it right. 
That's where you see the sidewalks or where there are sidewalks. So there are some where there's a sidewalk on one side along the parking structure, so you can get in and out of the parking structure. There is, in between the center and the south building, there is not a sidewalk along that side. And is there a reason why there's no sidewalk there? So it's a Caltrans intersection, and there's going to be a tremendous volume of vehicles going in and out. So we're doing our best to balance pedestrian safety with vehicular movement, so those paths don't always cross. And the highest number of vehicles are moving in and out at that center service road, and it's a signalized intersection, and it's an on-ramp to Highway 101 directly. So we're actually doing our best to deter pedestrian movement through that area by giving them many other options, primarily at Easton Creek in the South Wetland, but also secondarily at the North Service Road and the South Service Road. And so what I was just going to say is the idea that that's the kind of the main uh, ingress and egress from the parking garage. Okay. We didn't um, touch on in this presentation is that the pedestrian circulation out of the garages is actually on the Bay Trail side. So the primary circulation, if you're parking here, is going to be used to use the Bay Trail. So the whole project is, it's really about the Bay and getting pedestrians to that Bay Trail, even if they're just one more. Is that it? Uh, while we're on that topic, um, yeah, I was just curious why the, you go all the way to the back of the site to go into the parking garage instead of coming in, you know, closer to the street. Is there a reason for that? Just Can you go to slide 22? So all vehicles will enter off of Old Bayshore Highway. There are various entries into the parking structures from those three service roads. But the idea is that once you park your car, get out of your car, we're trying not to send people back to Old Bayshore where there's a lot of vehicular traffic and a lot of high volume intersections. So we're sending all people who are walking out to the Bay Trail and on that heavy red arrow kind of around to any of the buildings that they're heading to. This also, this circulation helps <clears throat> reduce potential for queuing onto the road. So if people are queuing in their cars, they're <clears throat> queuing on site and not onto a high okay. speed road. Got it. Thank you. And is the um, fire truck access, does it use the Bay Trail? So it would go all the way through those passages and then loop back around on the 20 foot wide Bay Trail? Ben, do you want to speak to the fire truck? Yeah, I can speak to that as well. We've provided laybys along Old Bayshore Highway. So the fire department can use those for any minor or non-emergency events that require trucks. So that was their preference to avoid going down the service roads at all. However, if there is a, a large event that requires them to, part of the Bay Trail is designed as a, an EVA route as well. And there'll be bollards placed to indicate where vehicles need to stop and where only fire trucks can pass beyond. How about a trash? Trash is also handled on the service roads. Um, we're, we're doing our best to consolidate all of the things that are less attractive to look at um, on the smallest amount of frontage, which is the service road frontage. So all three loading docks for the buildings are on the service roads. All trash management is handled on the service roads. Um, a large majority of the MEP spaces uh, that require exterior frontage are also on the service roads. So the transformers and utilities are inside the building or they're in those service roads? All transformers are inside the building. Great. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see. Another, this is kind of a general question. I'm not really sure you have purview, but I'm just curious what governs the building height. The FAA. The city does not have a height. There's no height limit. No. no. Okay, interesting. They require a special use permit for height, but mm -hmm. otherwise it's FAA. Okay, great. And the cafes are open to the public? Yes. Great. And uh, question for Kevin, the trees that are shown that appear to be on the beach at a fairly low elevation, is that a renderer's? Um, no, uh, those, I'll, I'll help them out. Those, <laughs> we don't own those. Those are on that oh, same really? parcel. Okay. This, if, if I'm thinking of the right ones, they're kind of these three strange okay right here great yeah I was just wanted to know what those were so I could use that <laughs> if, if you go to slide five you'll see the same trees okay 
Okay, great. All right, All right I think that concludes my comments. Anything else? Um, okay, Kristen. Um, it looks like there's a number of the facades on the ground floor that are totally opaque. And I was just wondering, is that because there's stuff happening behind them, or what's the what's the idea there? Oh, sorry about that. Uh, primarily, these being uh, life sciences buildings, there is some service stuff at the lower levels of the building that requires some some uh, some blank walls for sure. And however, Kristen, I would say, as a place designer, I'm kind of happy for them, you know, because they are there's some kind of earthiness to those walls. We think there can be. We're going to play with texture, um, and to not have to not have to have glass everywhere and there's sort of shininess of that and somewhat sort of a, a reflectivity of that at the lower level. Some solid and void play I think is going to make for a, a very good public realm. Okay, are there any further clarifying questions? I have one Here. question, one question. Um, um, is that Tom? This is Tom. Okay, Tom can go, yeah. Go sorry. ahead, Tom. <laughs> oh, were you about to, I'm <laughs> sorry. I just wanted to know, um, at, when you went through this round um, and you pushed back away from Easton Creek, for example, and away from the shoreline, did you put more square footage on top? Did they get taller as a result? No, we took it to the gut. Took no. it to the gut. <laughs> Correct. All right. <laughs> Tom, they, they can't get taller. We're bumping up against. You were already at, at, at. You were already at the. Okay, got it. All right. And just reiterating what Virginia said earlier of the the net loss of about forty thousand square feet that the project absorbed yeah. as part of this straight tackle diet, as Brian Childs put it. I was just curious if any analysis of prevailing winds in this location has been done and the impact of the building profile on the condition at the ground level. And you want to speak to that? Definitely. We have been working closely with the wind consultant from the beginning um, with a focus on pedestrian wind comfort um, at the ground level. Um, the, the results that we're happy to report is that there's, while there's a very small portion of the site that's in the comfort range today, we're going to be increasing the range of comfort almost fivefold. Um, the buildings actually do block the wind um, and put much of the bay trail in a wind protected condition, which will make it much more comfortable for all of the activities that we're showing here. The seating and the, the um, kind of exploring will be in a largely wind protected uh, condition. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, how does Easton Creek perform in that wind assessment? So there, there will be some wind in the view corridors. It's the only place the wind can get through. But what we've done, you know, in coordination with the, the wind consultant's advice is to, to break down the massing of the building, which we think helps along many fronts. But by breaking down the massing and offsetting and pushing and pulling, all of those extra corners do a great job at slowing down the wind and increasing the amount of comfort. The other thing is, as much as possible, we've programmed the areas where humans will be spending time, the picnic areas, et cetera, being mindful of the wind study. So there will be parts of the site that are windy, but maybe that you'll be passing through and enjoying the breeze. So uh, should I take that to mean that Easton Creek doesn't perform well in the wind or study, or is it? it it's in the comfort zone. Okay. It will not be as wind protected as some other parts of the site, but it is not in any way uncomfortable or hazardous. Okay, unless there's any other questions, we can move on to the public comment. Um, do we have people queued up for public comment? So I should read the instructions again. Uh, now that the presentation and board questions are complete, let's open the meeting to public comment. Any member of the public attending the meeting in person, please notify the board. Secretary, if you would like to make a comment. If you're attending online and would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand to speak. Remember, if you are joining our meeting via phone, you must press star nine on your keypad to raise your hand to make a comment. 
to unmute or mute, press star six. You will be called in the order your hand was raised and you'll have three minutes to speak. Ashley will note when you have one minute remaining. Please state your name and affiliation for the record at the beginning of your comment. As mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, if you would like to add your contact information to the interested parties list to be notified for future meetings concerning the project, please call or email Andrea Gaffney. Okay, on to public comment. Ashley Leeds, your audio is unmuted. Please state your name and affiliation, and you have three minutes to speak. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Design Review Board members. My name is Dashiell Leeds. I'm the conservation organizer for the Sierra Club Loma Prieta chapter, and I'm here preparing comments prepared by our chapter's Sustainable Land Use Committee. We have two comments on the very large garage structures. Parking garages are not always a pleasant or scenic experience for people using the Bay Trail. In fact, we are surprised that Burlingame allows such tall, bulky structures to block the views of the Bay and that are visible from the Bay Trail. For such a prime Bay Trail location, we hope that this will be taken into consideration. Uh, now we understand that these are life science buildings, therefore it would be good to see something that is alive, like a green garage with green remasking or enhancing the facades fronting the trail. Uh, there are many creative examples and it would be an ideal use for the very copious amounts of water that life science labs are known to require and use. Uh, many complexes this large are using microgrids to recycle their gray water for sustainability and facades clad with greenery would make the garage uh, less objectionable along the Bay Trail in this prime scenic location. Uh, the second issue is garage lighting. If tall garages have lighting left on all night, this can present a problem for the adjacent wetlands. And in the past, garages just stayed lit all night. However, now for energy conservation, many garages dim their lights and put them on motion sensors. And as you walk or drive through the garage, the lights brighten as you approach for security, and then they return to the dim level um, this is standard practice in many garages, and we highly recommend this approach for the protection of the bay. And thank you for considering these issues. Jennifer Chang Hederly, your audio is unmuted. Please state your name and affiliation, and you have three minutes. Good evening, board members. My name is Jennifer Chang Hederly, and I'm here on behalf of the Sierra Club's Bay Alive campaign. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My comments focus on the importance of striking a careful balance between creating inviting amenities for humans on the one hand and optimizing for sea level rise resilience and healthy ecosystems on the other. We appreciate that project proponents have engaged in open dialogue with us, and we're pleased to see that the, the elimination of a second bridge over the Easton Creek riparian corridor and reduced intrusion from boardwalks into shoreline and tidal marsh open space with potential for high habitat value. The reconfigured design maintains a high quality public experience and visual access to the bay and shoreline while minimizing human disruptions to wildlife. The design could be further improved, we think, by bringing the Bay Trail closer to the North Building and converting the picnic terrace and lawn area to a native landscaped picnic area outboard of the Bay Trail. This would make the picnic area feel more welcoming and open to the public, and it would reduce water demand and allow for additional upland migration space outboard of the levee. We hope you'll support these design improvements. Thank you very much. Rainy Fisher, your audio is unmuted. Please state your name and affiliation, and you have three minutes to speak. Good evening, members of the Design Review Board. I am Ronnie Fisher, speaking for the Audubon Society. Prior to this evening, we have had multiple discussions with Divco West and its consultants. After recent discussions, we are pleased to see that the project revised its plans removing boardwalks across wetlands and thereby encouraging ecological health, biodiversity and value as a nature-based sea level rise adaptation, all within the plan's footprint. It was also encouraging to read comments in the staff report that supported such actions being, being incorporated within BCDC's jurisdiction. One of those comments under public access design guidelines on page 12 noted that the project will need to consider other potential conflicts 
between proposed natural spaces and public access, inclusive of night lighting from buildings. With 10 and 11 story buildings proposed, we are very concerned about impacts of light cast across the creek, the wetlands and the bay, exposing nocturnal wildlife activity in, in flight or on the ground, which increases exposure to predation. For the same reason, at ground level, outdoor lighting must be limited in use, intensity, and color temperature, well shielded and time limited to direct light solely where and when necessary. Lighting should not be used to highlight art or architectural features or to emblazon trees where birds might otherwise nest or rest. These actions are essential to ecological health in habitats and in the adjoining project. Thank you for your attention to these details. We have no other public comments. Great, so I think we can move on to the um, board discussion. Uh, and I'm going to ask everyone except the board members to turn off your cameras so the board can have a focused discussion. Board members, please remember to turn on your microphones when you speak. Well, I, I can just, um, I'm sure we'll have a, a good discussion here. I just want to say that um, the um, connecting the Bay Trail, I mean, there are so many uh, really fantastic things. I mean, obviously, connecting the Bay Trail is a huge thing for this part of Erling Game. And the design has been, you know, I think very responsive and we've gone around the whole perimeter of the building and massaged and tucked and, uh, you know, really, um, I think, made a good effort to address all the comments in a very thoughtful way. Um, the, the ground floor experience, I think, is is really great. The way the the, um, the way the building is is set back, you know, I was a little skeptical at first about <coughs> the overhangs, but they're so far up in the air that I think it creates a really good uh, transitional space um, between indoors and out, and I think it really does uh, with the the setback balconies and the cutouts uh, under the colonnades really does. Um, you know, take a lot of the principles of, of um, Bay Area modernism that you see in residential architecture and kind of apply them at a, at a large scale that I haven't really seen done so well, you know, before. And I think you're right, uh, what you're saying, Kevin, about how those um, architectural spaces in the first two levels really does activate the, the, the outdoor space and will make it feel safer and more welcoming and more fun for people to visit. You know, people watching is, of course, the greatest uh, entertainment of all time. The habitat improvement, um, I think is really great that, you know, pulling people out of the, out of some of the areas so that um, plants and animals can, can exist, you know, without disruption. Um, I mentioned the indoor outdoor spaces, I think are great. The plant palette, I think is exceptionally good and appropriate. Um, so I think there's, you know, some other things that are probably going to come up, but I want to just start with that and, and just, you know, I think you all should be commended for a great project, um, you know, under the circumstances of a, of a very, you know, massive, uh, you know, um, a lot of building mass. So um, let me, I want to hand it off there to others and see, see what emerges. Tom has his hand raised. Hi. Yeah, um, I I agree with everything, Gary, that you just said. And uh, personally, I feel like this is a case study in how to respond to design review board comments. And um, I think the project has been dramatically improved. I think it's been thoughtfully handled in terms of how the cir circulation is is split between lobby and and uh, uh, more. Uh, natural systems access. I, thought, I think the push and pull in the facade has made uh, the first two floors a lot more interesting, shaping spaces and orchestrating the flow of it 
the way things kind of unfold. Um, I, uh, I think that the, I mean, I'm sorry you lost 40,000 square feet, but I think that value has been delivered to the, to the space that remains that will make it worth it in terms of people wanting to work here and spend time here. So uh, I would just say that much in a general sense. And I, I do think that the, maybe the garages could be uh, not, not a bad idea, uh, some green walls. And certainly all these lighting comments are, are uh, pertinent and important about uh, maintaining uh, uh, habitat via lighting controls. I also want to echo the commendation for how well you guys have incorporated all of the feedback. And also this packet was so thorough. There's so many drawings in here. There's so many that they're so small, you can't even see all of them. <laughs> so really, I mean, it really felt like you took our feedback to heart and really made some difficult choices, it sounds like, and real um, improvements. And I just wanted to specifically say, um, you know, first of all, this is going to be such a major transformation for this area, right? It's huge. It's a lot of people who are going to come and enjoy this wonderful waterfront, and I think that's fantastic. Um, some of the things that I think are really successful in this, um, in the changes, are the the way you have differentiated the trail from the programmatic areas. It's really clear that kind of like delineation in the pavement of where the bay trail is coming through and where the, for example, where the um, cafe. I, they're rendering, so they're not drawing, so I'm not sure exactly how you're going to resolve all of this, but I think the intent in the rendering is this coming through, that there's clearly that kind of hierarchy of the Bay Trail coming through, all of these um, little public places that are much clearer, I think, and more coherent in their programming, especially the addition of the cafe on the creek. I think if you think two cafes can work, um, you know, if they're going to really bring people, I think those are really going to be um, great ways to activate and make those places feel public. Um, uh, that public viewing platform is a really cool idea. Also with the addition of a public restroom. I mean, public restrooms are so important for people to be able to come and enjoy this place and stay. So that's great. Um, and that terrace is a really kind of special opportunity for a unique program that doesn't exist right now that might draw a lot of people. Um, and I, I really also appreciated the articulation of the buildings. I do think this kind of lower level sort of terracing with the upper level kind of glassier facade does work well. Um, the few things that I did want to give feedback on were um, I, I think the materiality of the ground floor is really fantastic. I'm particularly concerned with the opacity of the entrance on Easton Creek specifically, that kind of there is the big glassy lobby, but the corner facing the street is quite opaque. And I think just generally right there at that entrance into Easton Creek, it feels a little kind of undercooked. There's, I know it's facing this major interchange. And so there's a kind of a narrow sidewalk, looks like maybe a kind of a pull out for shuttles or something. And then it splits off into the paths, but it feels like that access point needs a little bit more space or gravitas in order to give it the sense uh, that there's this kind of important public space there because this really functions as one of the primary entrances to the, the park beyond. Um, and also I think kind of giving a little bit more transparency to that corner would help that building just feel a little bit more public rather than kind of a back of house. Um, another thing just, you know, I've said this about other projects like that, like office buildings around the bay is you know, it matters like where do you, where does the security truck park, right? There's these little kind of like things that people, because it's an office park, there's a sense maybe it's private. So just going above and beyond to make sure that people know that this is a public space through the semiotics of transparency and kind of generous public realm at gateway moments is important. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that I do think that the massing of the buildings at the creek is real is still quite overwhelming. Um, and I think you've got great landscape architects and you've got great architects who are doing a lot with these buildings, but the reality is that these buildings don't really look this transparent in real life. You know, when they have furniture in them and, you know, it's just the, the renderings make them look so light. And I think in reality that space is gonna feel quite kind of canyon like. 
And even something like a 10 or 15 foot setback at, you know, 160 feet or something to give those upper floors just a little bit of a step back would help that space feel a little bit more open, get a little bit more sunlight, um, just feel a little less overwhelming. I think bringing that line all the way from the parapet down to this kind of overhang is, is just quite overwhelming for that space. So um, I'm picking on that space, particularly because it's still in the public band, and I think it's important that this space kind of feels public, and I think those are the elements that people are going to see as publicness or not, is the spaciousness, the transparency of the ground floor, uh, ground floor and the kind of generous public realm as you enter the space. Thank you. <laughs> Good comment. Stop. Um, I don't have much to add. Um, I would agree that and I, I wasn't here in June. Um, but the, the, I, I, I do want to sort of commend you on the submittal and just how thoughtful you were in responding to the comments. Um, I just, I, I, I'm thinking about sort of your, the last sort of comment about framing the site in the context of sea level rise. And so uh, this could have been a clarifying question, but I think I'm sort of going to present this as just a, a larger question is that the nature of the phasing program and sort of how the open spaces are improved in the short term. So that has to do with the um, temporary improvements to the Bay Trail access that would happen around phase one, but um, allow a better connection through the site and, and what that looks like and sort of what that really means. Um, and then the, the other one is the the restoration of the the sort of East, Eastern Creek corridor, understanding that it's kind of straddling two phases or sort of two where we're two different existing users on the site and the extent to which that could sort of be massaged a little bit. Um, because right now we sort of see that the phasing boundary is at the hard edge of the Western side and just, or the northern side, and just thinking about sort of how that happens. Um, I'm biased because we just looked at a project that started construction in 1972 and was not finished. And so I think we just need to be mindful of that. Like, what does it mean to build half a floodplain in that location? Um, you know, is there some massaging of that sort of northern edge that can be done or some, some ways to sort of think about that edge between the two phases in a way that we're not stuck with half a project. Um, and the reason why I sort of bring that up is that the mid-century condition, that sort of 100-year flood of the mid-century condition, is um, it's substantial. So it, it, it would be fantastic if the whole site is sort of more pervious and green and layered and also raised, but um, that's, some, that's where we're sort of making a stretch, I think. So th I think that's the only comment or thought that I have. I think it's a, a really wonderful, um, and I would also say just the, um, the thought of making um, the corner of airport and Bayshore as sort of a public space, which sort of continues the, you know, the sense of sort of there being kind of a public shoreline all the way to Coyote Point. I think that's really strong. Um, and the fact that there could sort of be a living wetland in that space is just really remarkable. So it sort of pr presents sort of a new front door in a place that we sort of don't have one right now. So um, I think that's really commendable. But um, that if, if I had to find something that's sort of around thinking about sort of the phasing, the short-term public access, the sort of long-term um, habitat restoration and sort of how that happens with the building program. Great. Thank you. Those are uh, Great comment. Um, I'm going to go through these. Um, the well, uh, staff. Well, could I could I make a couple of comments yeah, here? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just following on my questions from earlier. Um, I would like to see the living shorelines connected to the bay uh, for existing and near-term sea levels and. 
it, it does sound like a rather odd situation where the rocky shoreline is is owned by someone else and, and i don't really obviously don't fully understand the implications of that in terms of making changes but i do think that for, um, for a living shoreline it it's better if it could connect with the bay um the beach uh i think could be bigger and wider <laughs> um uh just so that it it has you know more of a a space even with higher sea levels for uh for for waves to kind of dissipate and for it to shape itself um there aren't firm guidelines on that but i think it's something to think about and i i think if that was connected to the water and you could get to the water i think you'd find that a lot of people would like to use that space and so making it a little bit bigger if you can i think uh would be helpful uh and related to all that um there are several projects that are looking at integrating a gravel beach um, at the mouth of a wetland, especially if it's perched. Uh, it, it creates kind of a perched wetland, kind of a little more of a lagoonal system. And um, so I think you could, you could make a little bit of a, a transition, a more natural transition from the bay to your wetland um, and make a, a bigger grade change if you put in some coarser materials like gravel. Ideally, the, the wetland would, and the beaches would transition down to the low tide terrace, which I, I didn't see a cross section, but I assume that's somewhere around low tide on the other side of the rocks. And it's uh, like a mud or sediment flat. Um, so those are some ideas that I have as, as somebody that works with uh, natural uh, features, nature-based shorelines, and, and the like, and I don't, I don't think it's hard to do those things, and, and it, it looks like a real opportunity. I'm sorry that there's a property issue, but it would seem that perhaps the city could help you with that. I don't know. Uh, something to pursue. Um, otherwise, it looks great, and thank you for considering sea level rise. <laughs> yeah, thanks for those comments. Um... Bob, that's great. I was just getting uh, to some of that. I'm going to go through these what remaining uh, board or uh, staff questions for the board, which I think many of these we've hit. Do the project revisions adequately address the concerns raised at the June 13 CRB meeting? I think we've been through that. Are there additional improvements that could improve the public access experience along the shoreline and the creek? Um, Bob, I think your your question or your comments address that and you're not really talking about the public experience you're really talking more about the science and the resiliency of the shoreline is that, is that yeah, yeah yes and, and i think in particular one of the um, kind of restoration concepts is that when you have connection to the bay um, you provide a pathway for organic materials uh, which is i think particularly important for the wetland i wasn't quite sure exactly how the wetland gets its water if there's a barrier there but um you know, beaches can accommodate that. And, and to the extent that we have driftwood that's not uh, creosote treated, um, it actually can provide some nice uh, um, kind of diversity and habitat and organic material to the, and integrate with the beach and birds and like it, insects like it, and then birds like insects. Um, anyway, it's just the, the whole, but the people like that too. Um, and what we saw at Chrissy Field, for example, is um, people just love the beach there at the tidal mouth, at the inlet. I mean, it's just, it's just packed. So I think you'll find that, that people really like it as well as uh, uh, other you know, animals and plants. Great. Um, does the planting plan provide habitat value and are there any important considerations for ensuring the planting areas are successful at varying water levels? Um, I think that we talked about that. that I think there is a lot of habitat value. I have one picky comment that um, in your planting plan, you show a picture of Cerasus canadensis and call it Cerasus occidentalis because I know Cerasus occidentalis doesn't really grow next to the bay shore, and I know people try to pass off this analog as a native, but Cerasus canadensis 
is a tree and Ceres is oxygen, Talus is essentially a shrub. So that's, it's, it's only because I've seen that so many times. Um, I won't dwell on that. Um, are the public access areas appropriately designed to be resilient and adaptive to sea level rise in balance with ensuring high quality public access opportunities? Okay, I think we hit that. Uh, does anyone have a comment about the public comment to move the lawn to the other side of the Bay Trail? Anyone feel strongly about that? Well, um, I wasn't sure I fully captured it, but it sounded like uh, something that would enhance the ecology further. And I assume that the applicants will consider trying to do that, uh, given that they've been working so well with the uh, Sierra Club and Audubon. If it's yeah. spilling out. I, of a, I mean, of a I think it. Go ahead, Tom. Please. No, I, you know, I guess we should be looking at a plan of this thing, but I feel like if it's, there should be a little bit of counterpoint too. If it's spilling out of a cafe or interior space, people want to bring their food out and sit on the grass. I think there's value in that too. Um, depends yeah, that's on, a good point. Yeah. Yeah, I I kind of agree with that. I just want to throw it out there and see. I want to make sure we're not ignoring uh, a good comment from the public, but I think you need that. And the idea of moving the Bay Trail closer to the building could also present some conflict. So I'm not sure yeah. how that should go. Yeah, I wouldn't move that. So can, can somebody tell tell me what, are we looking at the number four? Yeah. Yeah, you know, if people are riding their bicycles along that trail or it might be a little awkward to bring it closer to the building. I don't know. Yeah, I agree, I agree. It's just a weird movement. Okay. Great. Um, last call for final comments. I, I just want to, I guess my last question is the, um, you know, views to the Bay is one of the main things that we, <coughs> you know, that we're asked to address. And I think as long as you're on the ground on site, you've got good views. And there's one, there's one drawing that, you know, where you see the buildings when you're up off the ground, I think, and, um, you kind of get a sense of how many people on the hills are going to lose their view to the water as a result of, you know, this big wall of buildings. So I don't really know to what extent we can or should address that, but I just wanted to put that out there. I appreciate the transparency of the buildings um, and the lightness, um, but, you know, it's a big project. Unless anyone would like to say something about that or something else, I, yeah, Kristen, please. Yeah. I mean, the city, it sounds like the city's approved an FAR of three. I don't know if that includes parking or not. Um, I assume it doesn't because it's quite, this looks like more than three to me. Um, the, I do think, you know, if they are allowing this height and this density, then ostensibly, that has already been that I think that's the it's the city's decision to say I think that the orientation of the buildings the bulk of the buildings um, makes sort of these view corridors to the water and having these parking garages between actually does kind of minimize some of the bulk so the, the bulkier buildings are a little lower and the taller buildings are a little bit more kind of um, you know east-west oriented to allow those views. So I think to the extent that the city allows this, that this is actually an appropriate massing of that type of bulk. I would just say again, I, I do think some kind of stepping or shaping of the buildings, particularly in the central Easton Creek area would help reduce some of that bulk in the place on the site where it is kind of the most intense. Okay, anything further? Um, I think we're supposed to make a determination as to whether this 
project should come back to the board. And um, I think that you know we made our comments previously, and the you know I think they've responded um, to all those comments, and and um, I think any further uh, negotiations or anything would be easily handled, or I don't know, easily, but could be handled by staff. <laughs> Uh, I agree. So I should. I think that. Okay, great, Tom. Anyone else have an opinion? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, they've they've done a lot already, and I would say though that if they wanted to come back in front uh, to us to talk about the things that I mentioned, I'd be happy to <laughs> talk more about those. But I I feel, I feel like they understand. I'm sure they understand what I'm saying. Um, but if they needed some review on that, I'd be happy to hear it again. Otherwise, I don't feel like I have a need to. Great. Well, I think overall, I mean, that's a very positive um, feedback you're getting from the board, you know, for just having been on the board for a number of years and seen many projects. I think it, 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 um, it's a very, very positive uh, endorsement from the group, you know, under the circumstances. So um, yeah. I guess with that, would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn, or do you have yes? Well, we often Andrew. ah yes um, we, yes allow yes. the project okay. proponents Left to out respond. There. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we'll just we'll just respond briefly. Mostly, it's um, it's a thanks. I think when we came in front of you in June and and didn't couldn't get this scheduled again until November, we thought, oh my gosh, that's a long time away. And I think. We've taken the last several months and taken your comments really seriously, and we're proud of the progress um, that we've made and, and appreciate kind of the work and comments that you guys put in to, to get us to this point. And, and thank you again for the comments today. Um, I think I'll, I'll just respond quickly to Kristen because you could have, it could have been planted, like the our design team comment about the lobby being more glassy at the corner was actually said in a meeting like maybe two weeks ago. And so we've recently reoriented um, that lobby itself. I think your, your word of it being undercooked um, was, was spot on and we're, we're cooking it. So it, when you next see it, you'll, I think you'll be pleased with how porous that particular lobby is. So um, yeah, just wanna, just wanna thank you and um, look forward to moving it forward. Great. Thank you again. So with that, can we make a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. <laughs> I second. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>